Please take a seat. We're supposed to start our session right now. Um, oh, I need the name of our session. There it is. Okay. I'd like to welcome you all to um, the session Deep Sea Responses to and Solutions for Climate Change. Uh, you all heard our, our plenary, hopefully, uh, so we thank Roberto Donavaro for that. I'd like to thank my co-conveners. There's four of us, um, Natalie Hilmi, Moriaki Yasuhara, and Telmo Morado. Are you here, Telmo, somewhere, maybe? Um, and we will all be uh, sharing the responsibility of keeping you on time and introducing you and taking questions and so on. So our invited speaker this morning is Natalia Gallo. She is a postdoctoral scholar at the Department of Biological Sciences at the University of Bergen and an affiliate of the Berkness Center for Climate Research. She currently studies the effects of deoxygenation and acidification on deep sea pelagic and demersal communities in western Norwegian fjords. So prior to uh, arriving in Bergen, she studied at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. Actually, in my lab, I forgot to introduce myself. I'm Lisa Levin. Um, and her PhD focused on how oxygen gradients in deep sea ecosystems, such as oxygen minimum zones, affects the community ecology of demersal fish. After receiving her PhD, she worked as a quantitative fisheries um, and ecology postdoc with the Cal Coffee Ecosystem Monitoring Program at Scripps and with the NOAA Southwest Fishery Science Center. So Natalia is also a, a member of the Early Career Ocean Professionals Network at the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development and part of the Deep Ocean Stewardship Initiative Climate Change Working Group. So, Natalia, please. Uh, thank you very much, Lisa, for that introduction, um, and also to you and the co-conveners of the session for the invitation to speak. Uh, it's a real privilege to be here. Uh, so, uh, I hope you're enjoying your time at the conference and in Bergen. Um, if you haven't heard before, Bergen is the gateway to the fjords of Norway. And most people, when they think about the fjords of Norway, do not think about the deep sea component of the fjords of Norway. So today, I will take you on a deep sea tour of the West Norwegian fjords and discuss how they can serve as microcosms for examining deep sea ecosystem responses to climate change and cumulative human stressors. And I just want to acknowledge that this work is done with a lot of collaborators across three different projects, Hippon Fjordfish, Clifford, and Coast Risk. So I've been very fortunate to be able to work with really excellent people here. Uh, so um, hopefully you heard Rob's plenary, so I don't really need to talk very much about climate change in the deep sea broadly. Um, instead, I will show you the climate change in the deep sea perspective locally. Uh, but just so we can start with framing some of what we'll hear about today, from the global perspective. If we look at the IPCC SROC report and take a look at how the deep sea is featured in that report, we see that there are projections that most deep sea floor ecosystems globally are already experiencing rising temperatures, declining oxygen levels, and declining CO and elevated CO2, leading to declining pH, and then also carbonate undersaturation. Fjords don't feature in the special report. Um, they're ecosystems that are, I think, generally thought to be more minor from a deep sea perspective. And certainly they're not open ocean ecosystems, which is what comes to mind more frequently when you think about the deep sea. Uh, but they're most similar to the continental slope seamounts and canyons that are included in the special report. And we know that these ecosystems are also projected to experience significant warming, pH decline, oxygen loss, and declines in POC flux. And these changes are projected to be much larger under the uh, business as usual emission scenarios compared to if we take a more proactive approach to our uh, global uh, emissions policies. Another important point for the deep sea, and this is a really excellent figure from the summary for policymakers, from the special report on oceans and cryosphere, 
is this look at kind of the main stressors and physical changes from climate change across ocean basins and also across marine ecosystems. And what we can see if we look at this line of the deep sea is that first of all, uh, in most parts of the world, uh, we have very poor data in order to actually be able to quantify and especially attribute any types of changes to anthropogenic climate change. And that's because first of all, we have less long-term data for the deep sea, and also because there is high variability sometimes of these episodic events like Rob discussed this morning. As a result, globally, uh, our ability to make the types of conclusions we can make for shallower water ecosystems are limited. So how can fjord research help us understand deep sea ecosystem responses to climate change and cumulative human stressors? So you might uh, have a hard time believing it, but these students are preparing and cleaning a plankton net. And even though you can see the land, we're over about 600 meters of water in this location. So welcome to the fjords. Uh, fjords are found in more places than just Norway, even though certainly if you look up Norway, you'll probably see a fjord because they're really important for our tourism here. They're really beautiful ecosystems. Um, but they occur in many mid and high latitude areas of the world because they're the remnants of glaciers that have receded in the past during past periods of cold climate. So they're really the fingers of previous uh, different climatic periods that we see in our landscapes today. Uh, they certainly occur in Canada, uh, in New Zealand, in Chile, here in Norway, in Greenland, in Iceland. So basically, your high latitude land areas have fjords. But they are true deep sea ecosystems. So uh, the deepest fjord is 1,400 meters. Most of the fjords we have here in Norway are deeper than 200 meters. And that's the definition that I typically use for the deep sea. So a lot of the fjords that I work in are 400, 500, 600, 700 meters deep and sometimes deeper. They're highly productive ecosystems uh, because the role of advection is really important, especially in bringing in zooplankton and nutrients from the open ocean. You have really high aggregations of especially mesopelagic organisms. So your common mesopelagic fish occur in the fjords. A lot of your other very common deep sea organisms, your deep sea fish like grenadier occur in the fjords. You have sea cucumbers on the bottom and sea urchins and brittle stars. So uh, these are true deep sea ecosystems. Uh, but, and you have uh, cold water coral as well and sponge grounds in the, reef, or in the fjords as well. But there are still fjords, which means that you have these isolated basins, which are separated by these much shallower sills. Uh, and that can really lead to basin water stagnation if you have changes in the circulation within these fjords. There are also carbon burial hotspots, so from a perspective of carbon sequestration, they play an important role in that. Um, they expand a nation's coastline substantially, so if you were flying into Norway, uh, you probably saw a lot of this at the plane window, right? I mean, our landscape is broken up by these fjords, and they're highly vulnerable to anthropogenic pressure. And that's because fjords are areas with many different human uses and industries. So uh, here in this one picture from some of our sampling in a fjord, you can see there's an industrial center right along it, an aquaculture facility, and a coastal wind farm here. So uh, people live along these coastlines. They live along these deep sea ecosystems. They use them. Um, they're important for tourism, for transportation, for fishing. Sometimes they're used for mine waste disposal, for coastal living. So quite interestingly, uh, one of the main fjords we work in is part of a UNESCO biosphere reserve. There have been people living along this fjord for over 7,000 years, which is longer in time than our sediment cores from the fjords will actually be able to resolve. So it's really incredible that there's this really long history of people living right alongside this deep sea ecosystem. And so in contrast to the offshore deep sea ecosystems, human influence in the fjords is direct and multifaceted. Why consider fjords from a deep sea climate change perspective? Well, they're very numerous. There are over a thousand of them. 
Um, and because of the characteristics of the sill and the latitude and how far in the fjord you are, you really have these varying conditions that you can use as natural experimental systems for understanding change, because each fjord, in a way, presents its own little experiment. The fjord we work in is called Moss Fjord, so it's here, it's about six hours north of Bergen. Um, and Moss Fjord is a deep fjord, so uh, you can imagine the basin here is about 490 meters deep. But in order to circulate the basin, water has to come over a 70 meter sill. So that's what I mean. You have these very deep basins that are separated by these very shallow sills. And we know that warming and freshening along the Norwegian coast leads to a lessening of this renewal frequency of the fjord basin water. So we get more stagnation in these fjords. And this can lead to hypoxic and even anoxic conditions in certain fjords. And then at the same time, we also see ongoing changes. Like for example, jellyfish, especially this one deep water jellyfish species, Paraphylla paraphylla, has become much more common in our fjord ecosystem. Um, we also know that the fjords are warming. So this is uh, the results looking at 91 different fjord systems here in Western Norway, where uh, Ingrid Johnson and colleagues used a two-layer fjord model to predict changes in temperature in the fjord basin uh, based on sill depth and latitude. And so what you can see is that uh, between two 30-year periods that they contrasted, uh, there's been a warming of about two degrees or one degree overall in the, these fjord basins. And this area where Moss Fjord is, around 61 degrees north, with a sill depth of 70 meters, kind of gets us into one of these areas where it's also experienced warming. And these are actual data from uh, three different fjord regions, where you also actually see time series showing uh, warming that's occurred. So uh, anytime we have observations, long-term observations from fjords, we see that a warming trend has been observed, and that's been approximately one degree of uh, warming since 1980. Uh, in the deep fjord area, so looking at depths uh, deeper than 400 meters, which are, is shown here in green. So fjords are warming. Um, also specifically, fjords are losing oxygen, some fjords anyway. And so this is uh, just an example from Moss Fjord. And so again, that's the fjord that I spend most of my time working in. And you can see an 11-year time series here of how oxygen changed in the deep basin of Moss Fjord. Um, this is also shown with periods of what was happening in Moss Fjord during that time. And here I've just drawn a threshold for hypoxia that's pretty conservative at about 2 milliliters per liter, 87 micromoles per kilogram. But you can see there was this really rapid decline of oxygen in the basin water of Moss Fjord uh, during the early part of our time series. And this is about 60% oxygen loss over just an eight year period, which is much more rapid than, for example, global trends in global deoxygenation. And then there was this very rapid reoxygenation event. And you know, here, you know, the points are just connected, but really this happened in one day. That's how rapid these changes are when a renewal happens. Um, and then recently we've seen some rapid drawdown happening again. So um, that's what's happened with oxygen in Moss Fjord. Uh, this is to show you that when uh, changes in oxygen occur, you also have changes in pH occurring. So uh, part of the sampling has been going out and collecting carbon chemistry data from both Moss Fjord as well as other fjords along the Norwegian coast. And here I'm showing you a regression of the oxygen concentration uh, compared to the pH of the water from all of these different fjords and water samples. And you can see there's a very tight correlation between the two. So basically, well oxygenated waters have higher pH and poorly oxygenated waters have lower pH. And so if we fit this using a GAM, a GAM just using oxygen explains 98% of the variance in pH. So we can use that relationship to basically back estimate how pH has changed during this deoxygenation period in Moss Fjord. And what we can see is that across that time series, that deoxygenation period was associated with a drop of about 0.2 pH units, which again, if we look at global trends, 
It's much more rapid than what we've seen in the global o open ocean at the surface and is consistent with the types of pH declines that are predicted for a lot of North Atlantic deep ocean ca uh, canyons for the future under RCP 8.5. Uh, but low pH isn't just a single variable. It's also associated with other important parameters in the carbonate system, including the saturation state of calcite and aragonite. And this affects the ability um, of calcifying organisms, how easily they can calcify, and then also how quickly net dissolution occurs if you just have an exposed calcium carbonate structure. So when these samples were collected in February 2021, when there was, were still low oxygen conditions in the fjords, we saw that there were certain fjords that actually had calcite under saturation and a lot of fjords. So the basin water of most of the fjords we sampled at that point were undersaturated with respect to aragonite. But renewal events can happen very quickly. And so in April of 2021, there was a large widespread renewal event and a lot of the fjords became renewed. So this was a cruise that I participated in now one year later in February 20, or in, sorry, in uh, February 2022. And here you can just see all of the different locations that we sampled um, and then what the bottom oxygen was. And here you can see the CTD profiles of all of the different locations where we sampled. And here's a hypoxic threshold drawn for you. So as you can see, one year later, all of the fjords in West Norway that we visited were well oxygenated, except for some very, very rare ones that are pretty much anoxic constantly, but we didn't go to that one. Uh, so yeah, so you can have a very rapid change in oxygen. And when you have that rapid change in oxygen, here again, I'm showing you carbonate chemistry data that were collected uh, during that next fjord cruise in February 2022. And now what we can see is that in no fjords do we see undersaturation with respect to calcite, and only at one or two sites do we see uh, any fjord values where it's undersaturated with respect to aragonite. Um, but one of the largest knowledge gaps isn't so much tracking what's actually happening in terms of the physics and the chemistry in the fjords. It's actually understanding how this affects the biology and ecology. And this is what I spend most of my time thinking about. Um, and so the three questions I want to share a little bit about with you today are, what are the ecological impacts of these physical and chemical drivers of change in the fjords? Do we see evidence of certain species being more or less sensitive? And then one of the big questions is, how uh, will climate change affect the carrying capacity of the Norwegian fjords? And the reason we can look at this is because in addition to having good physical and chemical time series data, we have excellent ecological time series data from Moss Fjord. And here I just want to point out the colors that I'm using because they'll be consistent in all future slides. So this early period prior to the low oxygen period in Moss Fjord is shown in blue, kind of a gradient of blue until we go to the really low oxygen conditions, which are in reds and oranges. And then after the recovery of oxygen, kind of the slow recovery and then the rapid recovery, we're in purples. Um, and so in this figure here, I'm showing you the change in oxygen relative to 2011 levels when conditions were well oxygenated in Moss Fjord. Uh, in relation to all the different depths in the water column. So the thing that you should really take a look at here is that the largest changes in oxygen in Moss Fjord really occur at this depth range below 300 meters. And we can look at this because thanks to this really excellent time series that's been collected by Ana Grovea Salvanes um, and many students who are uh, take part in this Bio 325 Ocean Science course at the University of Bergen, uh, they've been collecting net data across this whole 11 year time series. So we have a Harstad trawl, uh, which we use, and for the deepest samples here from 300 to 450 meters, this is just a net that goes down, fishes at that depth zone, and then comes up, but it's not an opening and closing net. But this is what we can use to look at this deepest area. Then for the shallower sites, we can use a multi-sampler, 
and that allows us to have a concrete depth stratified sampling because it actually opens and closes at the depths of interest. And so we have data from 300 to 200 meters, 200 to 100 meters, and 100 to zero meters from that. So what lives in the fjords? What are we catching? Again, all of our sampling is pelagic, so we're pretty much restrained to the demersal and pelagic organisms. But we know from past bottom trawls that there are urchins on the bottom. But this is more of what we catch. So there are some small shark species that we catch. We catch grenadiers. We have a really uh, abundant community of uh, midwater organisms, these deep water jellyfish. Um, a lot of mctophids of a single species, um, and then three common uh, dial vertical migrating crustaceans. And we're looking for changes in biodiversity. We're looking for changes in community biomass. We're looking at changes in community composition and relative abundance. And of course, the hypothesis is that if you have this very rapid deoxygenation and acidification per period in a deep sea ecosystem, the ecology should respond quickly, right? Uh, so here I'm showing you data on changes in biodiversity. And just to orient you, again, on the x-axis here, we have time. Um, the colors are consistent with what I presented before. So kind of the oxygenated period is in blue, the hypoxic period is in red or orange, and then this recovery period is in purple. And we're moving from our deepest depth zone here to our shallowest depth zone here for the community. We're looking at changes in species richness in the upper panel and changes in Shannon diversity in the lower panel. So overall, just a few trends I want to point out is that if we look across all of the changes in species richness, over time, we're seeing a general increase in species richness in the fjord. In our deepest water samples where we have the intense hypoxia period, we do see some evidence of decreases in species richness during this hypoxic period, but then a very rapid recovery into a higher biodiversity state following this low oxygen period. For Shannon diversity, we actually see that uh, these slightly shallower uh, depth zones that didn't experience the hypoxia saw an increase in species richness during the hypoxic period that was occurring deeper. Uh, but again, um, overall an increase in diversity, at least in some of the depths through time. Uh, if we look at changes in biomass in our community, and here uh, we're starting with our deepest at the bottom and our shallowest depth zone here, what we can see is that especially in the deep depths, there's been a large increase through time in biomass, in our community biomass. Um, there does not appear to be any sort of a trend with this low oxygen period. So basically, thank you, uh, biomass does not seem to be related to the deoxygenation trend. And so what's causing this increase in biomass? Well, it's this deep water jellyfish. So biomass is basically triple to quadruple during our time series, and the biomass of this jellyfish has increased by seven to eight fold during our time series. So they are really uh, becoming very important in terms of the biomass in this deep water ecosystem. We can also take a look at the, how the community as a whole has changed. And so this is a complicated figure, but I'll walk you through it. So it's a non-metric multidimensional scaling plot. And basically every colorful point represents one trawl sample. And here I'm just showing the trawl samples from that deepest depth. Um, you also see small points, and those, some of those I've labeled, those are associations with a specific species, which becomes more or less common in the community. Um, and so the way you interpret this is that points that are closer together are communities or trawls that were more similar in terms of who was there, how many were there, and points that are further apart are more different from each other. Uh, so the first thing we're looking at is if there's any evidence of grouping, so like all of the trawls from 2019, maybe all of those communities are more similar to each other than all of the communities from 2013, right? So we do see a little bit of evidence of grouping, but overall, not so much. The other thing we're looking at is grouping through time. So did all of the low oxygen period communities look more similar than the ones from better oxygenated periods? 
And we see some evidence of that right here with clustering in the oranges and the reds. And, but what we see is that these are kind of associated right in the middle. So it's like there's a dominant community, and then you get kind of more diverse community members that come in under different oxygen conditions. And when the community is in a low oxygen state, it kind of reverts back to its core members, which are mainly the dial vertical migrators here. We also uh, can see some correlation with environmental axes. So here I've shown the oxygen axis, the temperature axis, the salinity axis, and the year axis. So we see certain species becoming more common under well oxygenated conditions, like the ones here, Passifea, which is a deep water shrimp, uh, P. palachis, which is pollock. And then we see certain species here across on this side becoming more uh, common under the low oxygen period. So two different species of mackerel. And then here we have haddock. Uh, we had a master student, Carl Bukowski, who took a closer look at the three species of dial vertical migrating crustaceans. And he basically found that these three different species showed different relationships with this deoxygenation period. Overall, we saw that S. arcticus, this one up here, uh, showed overall negative trends in abundance and biomass across our time series, especially in the two deepest depth strata, whereas our krill species actually increased in abundance, so it became a more important species uh, in terms of the crustacean dial vertical migrating community. And then Passifea, this deep water shrimp, as I mentioned before, it actually did appear to be quite sensitive to the low oxygen period and decreased in both abundance and biomass during this low oxygen period. So um, how sensitive are fjord communities to climate change? Uh, we saw that, they, that biodiversity was sensitive, but we saw a very rapid recovery following the reoxygenation. Um, did we see large changes in communities um, in response to deoxygenation? We saw some partial changes, but not nearly as strong as we expected. Um, and in terms of the question, how will the carrying capacity change? We saw that the biomass of the community increased. Thank you. Um, but we can't really say that much about the carrying capacity overall yet. So, why are we not seeing stronger responses? Possibly because we're doing pelagic sampling, so we're missing really the near seafloor community on the bottom. Um, we may not be considering ecologically relevant time lags correctly in our interpretation. It's possible that dial vertical migrators are less sensitive to changes because they're migrating through these different oxygen zones daily. And then we also see this other change of the paraphyllic increase that seems to be not responsive to oxygen, but is clearly affecting the community. So we're looking at all of this as part of Clifford and recoupling the observational data that I told you about today with a lot of modeling approaches to really get at that carrying capacity question. And I'm just gonna skip ahead here and just say, okay, so are fjords good microcosms for deep sea ecosystem responses? In some ways they are, because we see the types of trends that you see and project for the deep sea in the future, but they happen at much faster time scales. On the other hand, they're also rapidly reversible when a renewal event takes place, so maybe there the equivalency isn't there. Um, we see, still see difficulty in tracking and attributing climate impacts. Um, and we see that fjord communities may be more adapted to this large variability in climate change variables than kind of more stable deep sea communities. Uh, but these considerations, the ecological lags, nonlinear responses, and combined stressors are consistent with what we should be thinking about for open ocean deep sea ecosystems. So for that, with that, I'd just like to thank you for your attention. Okay. Uh, thank you, Natalia. We can take a, a quick question or two. Come on up. I, uh, go ahead. We, we, yeah, we don't have a mobile microphone, I don't think so. <laughs> that was a fascinating presentation. Thank you. Um, I work on the west coast of Canada in the fjords there, and our fjords are, the deep water is renewed annually at the time mm -hmm. of um, upwelling. Mm -hmm. So I was very surprised to see your time series. Did it really mean that you only had one renewal event in the whole 10-year time series? Yeah, uh, a full renewal event, correct. Yeah, uh, we think that there are maybe some smaller partial renewal events that occur more frequently, but they don't have the same effect on the deep fjord basin water. 
and are your cruises all at the same time of year? Uh, the course cruises are, so we go every September with the student cruise, but then we also have project-based cruises at different times of the year and a different student cruise that goes out every February. All right, so you don't think that there's any chance you were missing renewal events then, right? Yeah. No, well, and we have moorings out in that fjord too. Yeah. Right. Okay, great, yeah. thanks. Thank you. Hi, Natalia. Uh, great talk. Uh, I have a question on the low oxygen event and then the renewal. Do you have a sense of how much of that is driven by uh, large-scale oceanographic conditions outside of Norway versus uh, local conditions? Yeah, so it's somewhat similar. So you need a good upwelling conditions, and so you need north northerly winds blowing. And uh, the renewal usually happens in the spring or the summer. So you basically need to have the right circulation features offshore, and then you need to have the right density stratification actually in the fjord because the density of the fjord basin has to be less than the incoming water coming in for a renewal to take place. So kind of both of those need to be uh, correct. But I mean, the, the, the wind strength could certainly be uh, driven or related to larger scale climate trends like NAO, for example. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so for all the speakers, we're, we're going to give you a, um, we'll, we'll, we'll tell you it's two minutes, but that means it's, it's two minutes to 12 minutes, and then hopefully you'll wind up so we have some time for questions. Great. Uh, I'm Moriaki Asara, chairing this morning session. And the next speaker is uh, Quentin Graff. And uh, he's talking about gelatinous macrozooplankton response to climatic change and implication for the deep sea. Please. Hi, everyone. So I'm Corentin Clair. And I will today present the last part of my PhD work, co-supervised by Laurent Bopp and Olivier Aumont. And I would like to first to thank all the collaborators in this work, and in particular, Michael Vogt, Fabio Benedetti from ETH in Zurich, and Olivier Mori from uh, SET. Uh, and so I'm going to talk about gelatinous macrozooplankton response to climate change and implication for the deep sea. So as you know, due to increased certification and reduced nutrient supply, the net primary production in the ocean uh, is projected to decrease by 3% by the end of the century under the high emission scenario. As a consequence, phytoplankton is projected to decrease by a few percent by the end of the century. But due to trophic amplification and reduced transfer efficiency, zooplankton would be more affected by climate change and decrease by 9% by the end of the century. Nevertheless, most of the biogeochemical components of the semipsis uh, model are uh, parameterized as non-gelatinous macrozooplankton and are mainly parameterized as crustaceans. And so we may wonder how the inclusion of gelatinous zooplankton in such model would affect the response of zooplankton to climate change. But first, what is gelatinous zooplankton? Gelatinous zooplankton forms a fragile food web and are, is constituted with organisms with high water body content. And the most studied groups are cnidarians, also known as true jellyfish, and cnenophores, also known as comb jellies. But there is another taxonomically distinct group of organisms, namely pelagic unicate, which includes one mesozooplankton group, appendicularians, and three macrozooplankton groups, pyrosome, doliolids, and salps. And for this study, I will focus on large pelagic tunicates, and for which I will refer as regelatinous zooplankton in the rest of this talk. Under climate change, there is a high uncertainty about the future of genus zooplankton. It has been documented as a a paradox between a high consensus in the science about the further increase of gelatinous zooplankton, but based on a few data, and this is documented as a jellyfish paradigm. And this is even more important for large plastic tunicates, for which we have really a few amount of data. Still, there are some hypotheses to explain those differences. First, there are direct physiological effects that could favor those organisms compared to others in the context of climate change, such as lower sensitivity to warming, acidification, and deoxygenation. And there are also indirect effects on which I will focus on this study. Namely, large plastic tunicates are filter feeders, so they can access to a wider range of prey than other macrozooplankton. And in the context of climate change, small phytoplankton 
are supposed to be favor over larger phytoplankton, and that would make uh, a higher prey av availability to gelatinous zooplankton than to other uh, zooplankton, and that could favor those organisms. In parallel, gelatinous zooplankton are increasingly recognized as key component of the carbon cycle. There are many recent data-driven studies uh, in this sense, and also, those organisms have been included in two biogeochemical models, uh, one inclusion in the cobalt model by the Jessica Duos team in uh, the USA, and we included in our team in the PISCASE model those organisms, and I will uh, illustrate my purpose based on uh, this recently published study. So due to their dense and rapidly sinking carcasses and fecal pellets, pelagic tunicates can efficiently transport, export carbon to the depths. And here on the figure, you can see the contribution, the model contribution of gelatinous zooplankton to the total particulate organic carbon fluxes. And you can see that this contribution is increasing with depth and reach almost 70% uh, at the very deep ocean. When we look at the spatial pattern, those organisms are higher contributors in oligotrophic gyres, in which they reach 40% of the total POC flux at 1,000 meters. So, as a consequence, we may wonder how gelatinous zooplankton will be affected by climate change and what would be the indication for the deep sea as they are important to the deep sea carbon cycle. To do so, we use uh, the biogeochemical component of the IPSL model, PISCES, which includes five nutrient pools, uh, an explicit representation of particulate and dissolved organic matter, two phyto. Oh two phytoplankton and two, two zooplankton, macrozooplankton and mesozooplankton. And we also explicitly represented the carcasses and... Uh, no, sorry. And we added two new macrozooplankton groups to this uh, model. One generic macrozooplankton, which aims to represent non-gelatinous macrozooplankton and mainly feed on mesozooplankton. And one gelatinous zooplankton, which aims to represent pyrosomes, dolyolids and salps, and which feeds on a wider range of organisms, as you can see here. We also explicitly represented the carcasses and fecal pellets of those organisms, which are supposed to be the main driver of their influence on the carbon cycle. And you can note that we, they have particularly high uh, sinking speed uh, in the model. And we perform a simulation, so historical and uh, future change simulation under two RCP scenarios, one high emission scenario and one low emission scenario. And I will focus on the result for the high emission scenario. So when we look at the biomass, uh, pelagic biomass of macrozooplankton, as expected, uh, both group of organisms are affected by climate change and their biomass are decreasing by 13% uh, under by the end of the century. But more interestingly, the non-gelatinous macrozooplankton is more affected than gelatinous macrozooplankton and there is a 3% difference in the biomass anomaly of those two groups of organisms. And to explain this pattern, we have to look at the spatial pattern. So here I present a map of the ratio between gelatinous zooplankton and non-gelatinous zooplankton. And the first pattern you can see is that gelatinous zooplankton is dominating in uh, oligotrophic gyres, which are delimited by the uh, green line. And if we look at the future of those organisms, you can see that the, there is an extension under climate change of those oligotrophic gyres, and this is associated with an extension of the area in which gelatinous zooplankton is favored. And this is the driver of these distinct anomalies between our two groups. And this has implications for the carbon cycle. When we look at the 100 meter POC flux anomaly, namely the quantity of particles that cross the 100 meter horizon, as in previous study, we project a decrease by 70% by the end of the century of this flux. But when we look at the driver of this anomaly, smaller organisms than macrozooplankton are mainly driving this anomaly, and so uh, the macrozooplankton are not really important for this anomaly. But when we look at the seafloor anomaly uh, and the deep seafloor, so we consider the particles that reach the seafloor, which is deeper than 1,000 meters, you can see first in terms of spatial patterns and in oligotrophic gyres, there is a reduced anomaly compared to the surface uh, flux. And when you look at the contributor to this anomaly, you can see that macrozooplankton is driving this anomaly, and the main important driver is gelatinous zooplankton, 
so that delta in the plankton plays a buffering role on the deep POC flux. And this effect is particularly important in oligotrophic gyres. And when we compare with the model in which we artificially kill all jellyfish, you can, uh, all the gelatin zooplankton, the anomaly uh, is, we can deduce that the anomaly is reduced by 25% in oligotrophic gyres when including uh, gelatinous zooplankton. And this has implications for the future of the bantos. Indeed, uh, in the last IPCC report, uh, there is a figure showing that the bantos is projected to decrease by 30% by the end of the century. And this is uh, derived by many factors, such as warming, acidification, deoxygenation. But as you may see, decreased POC flux is an important driver of this decline in bantic biomass. And so, as gelatinous zooplankton seems to be a key player in the deep sea carbon cycle, and as its contribution to POC flux and to the ocean response to climate change is increasing with depth, all studies suggest that gelatinous zooplankton must be taken into account when studying the impact of climate change in the deep sea. But of course, this is a model approach, and as we discussed in our recently published study, it was really hard to validate the model due to the patchiness of data. And for this reason, we are thinking in uh, go deeper into the data and maybe use a species distribution model type approach to uh, disentangle what are the environmental drivers of, uh, of what drives uh, self uh, pelagic tunicate biomass. Also, there is no representation in our model of the potential interaction with fish and fisheries. And so we are also thinking in coupling our model with upper trophic level models, which, will, which would maybe help to disentangle the, the food web impact of uh, gelatinous zooplankton in a changing climate. So thank you very much for your attention, and I'll be very happy to answer any question. Any question? That was really interesting. Thank you very much. Um, I, I'm curious, when I'm diving in the bottom of the deep sea floor, I often see unconsumed pyrosomes and, and uh, jelly organisms. And I'm wondering, do you feel like they're equally edible to the other kind of POC flux? You know, the, you, you said they're going to buffer the food supply uh, to the deep sea, but are they... You know, yeah. nutritionally, uh, you know, the same? Yeah, actually, it's really, I don't have the answer to this question. And when I, I have a look at the references, I only found one data-driven study that uh, says uh, that uh, jelly falls increase, <laughs> actually increase the, the biomass of uh, bantos. It was, I think it was in a Norwegian fjord. I'm not sure, but I, there were only one study that explicitly shows that uh, they can be eaten. So at least it's possible in some uh, in some places, but I have no response about the. In the I, mean, I, I think they can be eaten. I, I think they can be eaten, but I think it might be a slower process, and maybe not everything can, can especially the different kinds of tunicates, right? Yeah. Yeah, and I think also as there are um, swarming organisms, there are some places in which they accumulate uh, really rapidly, and so. Uh, in those places, maybe they are not, at the time as they fall, there are not enough uh, predators or feeders, that, and that could explain why you observe the almost intact organisms at the, at the bottom. Yeah. Very interesting. So with this increase in POC at the bottom, it seems that they could be really um, exporting a large quantities of carbon quite quickly to the bottom, so it might be a good mitigation solution. But I wonder, and maybe I've missed it, uh, <clears throat> what sort of negative effects are there projected for the biodiversity because of that increase in gelatinous groups? Yeah, actually in our models there is no representation of the bantic mm -hmm. organisms, so or, or for pelagic, the bantic, but what sort of uh, on pelagic, structural, yeah, uh, those organisms. negative consequences are you expecting maybe? Yeah, there are some hypotheses about uh, replacement of the niche that is freed by the fish, which are fished and uh, affected by climate change. And so, so those organisms may 
takes this, those ecological, ecological niche and uh, replaces those organisms. Um, but uh, historically, those organisms were considered as uh, trophic dead ants, but there are uh, recent proofs that those organisms are eaten, actually eaten by a, by a lot of predators. So, so yeah, the, there is not an <laughs> absolute response. And I, I don't think we can think, uh, say uh, it's bad or good effect on the ecosystem, but sh sure, it can impact the structure of the ecosystem also. Thanks, so. Yeah, thank you very much. So the next talk is recorded. Uh, it's by Diego uh, Edihi Rivera uh, Rosas and uh, talking about assessing biodiversity change through time in the world's most productive fishery with the uh, use of environmental DNA. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for coming today to my talk. Today, I will be presenting the work that I did during my master's thesis, titled Assessing Biodiversity Changes Through Time in the World's Most Productive Fishery with the Use of Environmental DNA. So without further ado, let's get started. First off, we have a problem. We know that ocean ecosystems have been degraded to different extents. Sometimes we don't know exactly to which extent, which is also one of the bigger problems that we have. We lack a baseline to understand what exactly has changed and how. So sometimes we have um, some records mentioning, okay, yeah, there was this event in 1900 that probably caused this and this, and there are uh, sparse records of exactly what happened, and there was no research performed during those times. So it is hard to know exactly how it was affected, how a community was affected by, say, uh, a very big climactic event or an anthropogenic effect at that time. So it is also difficult, similarly, to observe the effects of long-term dynamics and oscillations in an area that does not have these proper records, and how does it affect um, the community that lives there. This is, of course, particularly true in hadal environments where the sampling is um, more difficult and more expensive to do. So what do we propose for this problem? What we are using, what we are aiming to use, is using environmental DNA. Environmental DNA is rising new technologies that is based around the DNA essentially dropped by an organism that passes by an environment. Uh, it can be skin, it can be epithelial cells, etc., etc. So this can be deposited anywhere. It can be in the water, it can be in the ice, or in our particular case, in the sediment. So sediment has this very particular feature which is, of course, the layers form on top of it. So you might have a layer of sediment where DNA is deposited, and just naturally time will pass, and more sediment will be deposited, and now you have another layer of eDNA as well. So if we couple these layers with geochronologies, where we have essentially a top layer that has some eDNA data, and then we have a layer down there that has some other eDNA data, and they both have different times. We can try to, to inform what exactly was in that top layer at, let's say, 2020, but also on that bottom layer, which was around 1980. So we can have a record of historic communities that were in a certain place. And of course, this is very useful in places that do not have a detailed record of events and the effects that these events have. And one of these cases where this can be very useful, and we set our eyes in, was the Atacama Trench area between Peru and Chile. So the Atacama Trench is the world's largest trench, uh, covering almost 6,000 kilometers. And it has very unique challenges and features that make it a very interesting place to work in. First off, it is subject to climactic oscillations of ENSO and PDO, ENSO being El Niño and PDO being the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. And with these events that have also risen in strength because of climate change, there was this one particularly big strong event in 1997 where it provoked the decline of anchoveta stocks in the region, which in turn caused a fishing crisis, and which also in turn caused um, more regulations to start uh, rising up to try to combat overfishing 
because of the effects of these climactic oscillations that it may have. Uh, so why is this area been so overfished? Because it is a very, very productive upwelling zone that is associated with the Humboldt current. It is actually one of the most productive areas in the world and one of the most fished. So it reached an all-time high in 1988 and after a, while, after a while the fishing stock started to decline very heavily. So now that we have this information, uh, what we did what our collaborators did was um, board the RV zone in March of 2018, and we collected cores from 7,700 uh, to 8,000 meters, and we collected these five cores. So afterwards, our collaborators uh, Kazumasa Oguri and Ronnie Glut, they took um, a part of the sediment that we sliced into one centimeter slices. Uh, they took part of it to calculate uh, the approximate years that each layer covers through lead to 10 analysis. And of course, we can use EZNA to know what the community looked like at a certain time, but how do we compare against each other? How do we know what specifically changed the community composition from 20 years to the next 20 for saying one thing? Um, so we, we took um, two ENSO indexes for the region, um, the ENSO 1 plus 2 uh, index and uh, the more general ENSO index worldwide. And we also took the Pacific, Pacific Decal Oscillation Index. And of course, to compare, we also had a sea surface temperature to know exactly the effect of temperature in these communities. Um, we took chlorophyll A and the anthropogenic effects, which were the reported catch and the aquaculture production for the region. So now that we had our own samples, our little sediment, we used, we extracted the DNA and we used two different primers that we specifically wanted to focus on the eukaryotes and the pelagic eukaryotes of the region. So we used um, these two primers, the V7 and V9 focus. And since we had a very, very large array of data with this, with this sediment. We filtered to only using pelagic taxa that had at least the taxonomic order assigned. So what did we find? First off, um, we, did the two, we did the analysis separately for the two primers to compare. Uh, for the first one, we find a lot of reads and we find 1,479 unique pelagic taxa that were found thanks to the V7 primer. And here you can see we have a very good distribution of taxa across multiple files. This is only showing um, the top taxa that were found, but we have a very good distribution of it. So it is not wholly dominated by one, uh, by one file, but rather it's a diverse um, community. And what happens with the V9 primer? Well, the V9 shows a little bit of a different story. We have also more reads, and it shows actually more unique pelagic taxa. We have more unique taxa, but it has less taxonomic clarity because only a few, a few individuals identified in the DNA were able to be related to species or even genus level. So of course, what you can see here, it's, uh, it shows a less um, diverse uh, community mostly dominated by radiozoans and acrophytas, which are, of course, more abundant, and we have a better DNA library to compare to. So it shows this. However, the really interesting thing that we got was we have a comprehensive assessment of the eukaryotic pelagic biodiversity in the area, and one of the first few, since this area has not been completely explored. And we have a really highly diverse species-rich community that is formed of mainly animals and chromis. Uh, our reeds are mainly, of course, as I mentioned, of skeleton-forming unicellular organisms, uh, chordates and idarians. And we found, overall, with the use of these two primers, 24 phyla, 46 classes, 126 orders, 187 families, 250 genuses, and 282 species. However, it is important to the note that we are limited thanks to the barcoring library resources. It's important to know that only one out of ten, one of 
out of each 10 reads that we had was able to be assigned to the species level. So there's still a lot that we can work on as a team of researchers to improve the, the library barcoding resources. So what we set out to do after this, we know now what is here. Okay, but how has it changed? We found a really, really interesting graph. So this is a graph showing the alpha diversity. We've been the years into intervals of 25 years to have a better understanding of what has happened. So you can see here, um, we have sort of a trend in rising diversity until the 1977 to, to 2002 period, pardon me. And you can see it here. So if you recall that I mentioned earlier, between 1977 to 2002, we had a particularly catastrophic and so event in the region. And we also had the history, the highest overfishing that has been in the region ever. So we might not have known at the time how it affected it, but now we're looking at it and we can see that it, there was a decrease in biodiversity, not only in abundance of the fish stocks that was mentioned at the time, but rather the whole community was affected by this. And so we looked into this first in one gene and we thought, okay, maybe it was just one gene, but no, you can actually see the same pattern and it actually even worse than in the case of the uh, V9 primer. So yes, it's one again showing this trend of decreasing biodiversity at this point in time, which is actually very worrying, but we also see an increase afterwards. And of course, this could be just due to um, DNA conserving better in the top layers, but also after these um, catastrophic events for the region, there were very better implementations and, the law, and better laws that helped reduce fishing pressure. Okay, so now that we know this, um, we know now that the diversity has increased in this period in time, we set out to know what happens to the VETA diversity then? How does this change? And so we did this plot, uh, which basically represent each one of these points, uh, represent one point in time, one community at a point in time. And the ellipses form around more or less how different these communities are. And actually you can see that there's not much of a difference, which is interesting and is also kind of weird. So we have this community, this community that has changed over time, that we know decreased over time, but it seems relatively stable all in all. And there is no, not being any big changes that actually separate one time period from the other. The community remains mostly the same through time. So to summarize here, we have a really important decrease in diversity from 1977 to 2002, which coincides with the number of factors, which is the overfishing, and which is also, of course, the the ANSU event that happened. However, we have a core community that remains mostly the same through time, and we're looking at the differentially abundant um, taxa that were causing this decrease in abundance, in diversity, sorry. In this period, we actually found the the individuals that decreased the most, the tax that was decreased the most, was actually the Chromista Kingdom, and jellyfish and Thelicia. So all these are uh, gelatin gelatinous organisms that sometimes we might not associate with conservation, with conservation goals that, okay, we need to protect these because these are the most vulnerable. I would usually associate that to mammals, to higher order species, to maybe more charismatic species, but we're seeing here that maybe they're not the most affected by climate change, but rather smaller organisms are. And so when we tried to determine what exactly caused this, we went onto the metadata that I mentioned before. And we have here on the left, a uh, graph showing exactly just how each determined variable has changed through time. So the index, the Nino index, can show you how it increased around 1980, 1990, and then it's now following a pattern of decrease as is usual with the El Nino. Uh, same for the Pacific Decadal Oscillation Index. Uh, chlorophyll A concentration has actually shown to increase. And of course, here you can see the tons of fish caught uh, get to a really high point and then decrease thanks to the regulations. 
aquaculture, however, has only increased. And curiously enough, aquaculture was the only one that showed the an actual effect, an actual effect that has affected the communities. And when we want to explain why, it actually has a very, very high annual growth rate in Chile. And there is an effect of the salmon farm escapees that tend to happen a lot in this region and can affect biodiversity. So all in all, um, eDNA with geochronologists is an emerging and solid tool for the future that we can use to look at the past despite the limitations that um, the environment or the history has. And we can really see an important biodiversity decline in 1977 to 2002. And we can see that the community composition has stayed relatively the same for the last 120 years, despite the anthropogenic and climatic pressures. However, it is important to note that these pressures affect mostly gelatinous animals and animals which do not consider mainly as important as others. So yes, thank you very much for coming to my talk and I hope you liked it. If you would like to communicate further, uh, I leave my email here. Thank you very much. Very interesting talk. So if you have any question to the speaker, you may use up and uh, I think he can respond. And the uh, next speaker is a Hong Kit Rui and he's talking about Enso-like variability of mass and foraminiferan shell flux in the deep basin of Northern South China Sea, a decadal time series study. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Kit. Killer, you can call me Kit, from the National Science University of Taiwan. So ta Taiwan is in degree about 22 degree north, quite different than Bergen, right? So the first time, first day I arrived Bergen, first thing I catch first is catch cold. <laughs> <laughs> so I try, 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 try to bring the story about the tropical uh, uh, marginal sea, the South China Sea, which is the world's largest marginal sea, and how the ENSO signals transport from the surface to the deep, to the deep sea. And I, I like this uh, session, Deep Sea Responses and Solution. So it brings people that during the marginal sea together. But why marginal sea important? It is because it has a small mass and fast ventilation rate. So some, some change, some climate change signal can very easy and fast to transport into the deep sea. So you can, sometimes you can see the things that happened in marginal sea would be more uh, robust and more fast. And what happened in the marginal sea, it might be happened in the open ocean. So as, as we just mentioned today's plenary session of uh, our speaker. So I try to start with the Sea of Japan first. So 2017, we just construct the, uh, we, we believe during this time is the longest uh, uh, observed data of the apparent oxygen utilization. So you can see that the surface almost no, uh, didn't change with time. So you can see it's very long time series data. But when we go, go to the deeper ocean, 2,000 meter depth, 2,500 meter depth, you're seeing the AOU increases very significant with a rate much higher than, 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 than we, we saw yesterday, the deoxygenation session, right? 10 times more, 10 times more, okay? And without too much variation. So pH shows the mirror image, but if someone say there's a, a two sides of the same coin. Uh, but, 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 but why it will happen? We believe that it's likely due to global warming. So the vertical ventilation stagnate. So, so the Sea of Japan, deep sea of Japan, accumulates a lot of CO2 due to uh, organic matter decomposition. So AU, AU increases very fast. So it means that deal dropped, okay? And pH decreases. But you see that the pH, the surface, it have dropped 
point double zero one six, uh, which in line with the rate we think that、uh, assuming the air C C O two equilibrium, okay, also in line with a lot of the uh, uh, open ocean time series data. But take a look about the deep water, much faster, much faster. Okay, so so that that is a way to to show that、uh, global warming. And the ventilation stagnated. Then you can see that, okay, the surface water, it contact the human released CO2 the first, but the deeper ocean have the fast esterification rate and the oxygenation rate. So then we think about that. But Taiwan also have a time series in the South China Sea. It's named the Sit. The Southeast Asia Time Series study, and it, it starts by Jacob, Jacob, uh, Jacob, uh, and 2003. We start, we still carry on. So we do the water sampling,、uh, measure the mainly the carbonate chemistry, and serve the、uh, study of physical pump. And we also collect the second particle, but it's more lately, 2000, starting from 2003, and serve for the biological pump study. So what we do?、Uh, this is the sea station located one one six degree east and eighteen degree north, and here's Philippines, Taiwan, China. So there is a strong western boundary to be called it's a Kuroshu, a Kuroshu. I'm sorry, and sometimes it will intrude into the South China Sea as a Kuroshu branch. So we deploy, we deploy a more system, and have a second trap at two thousand meter depth. And three thousand five hundred meter depth. So、uh, duration time is normally six months, and we have、uh, the resolution about eight days. So nine days ago, they still doing the same thing. <laughs> like so, so, so my colleague sent sent me some photos that they are deploying then, and also uh, 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 co- collecting back the sediment trap. So. What you can see is that in this row set you have the sampling bottle, and inside are the sediment that is sinking to this bottle. So it,、uh, if you do the filtration, then you can get、uh, a lot of this、uh, shell. So it's a teropod, the shell of teropod. Well, I took、uh, I took this fresh one from other sources. You 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 know the sed- sediment traps normally can in in this deep. Basin cannot have the live uh, uh, teropod because they almost decom- decompose. So only the shell that uh, uh, released. So what we want to look is is the thrust, the rate of the amount that we collect. Sometimes we filled, but sometimes almost almost filled up of the bottom. So I just brought from 2013 till now, and what we get the mass thrust. And two、uh, thousand、uh, value the in blue and three thousand five hundred in red. Very similar. So it means that a lot of the organic matter just decompose in the shallow water, and they sink very fast. So you don't see that there are quite different、uh, pattern of change. Although some people believe,、uh, not I'm sorry, not believe, expect that two thousand may get higher rate, but sometimes. Yes, but sometimes no. So we are not that confident for that. The formiferous cell first generally uh, uh, follows uh, the pattern follow, follows that of the ma- mass first, and this shell contains eleven common formiferous species. But if you want to uh, 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 go through each of it, you uh, uh, you can uh, read uh, this paper that we wrote. Purpose、uh, months ago, but what we observe is that sometimes the mass flash could be very fast, but sometimes we just very low. Then, then we don't know whether this is we、uh, we were not very sure about the reliability of this data and, until we try to do something such as the shell first and the mass first. They are linear correlated, even if they are not linear, they are positively correlated. So it means higher the mass first, higher the 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 surface, but why there will be a certain kind of pattern of changes? 
The first is that we defined all of this uh, 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 higher first is in the winter time. That that is reasonable because South China Sea is a oli oligotrophic ocean. So what you need is the nutrients to support the productivity. So during the winter time, the strong monsoon that uh, very fast bringing all of the uh, 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 nutrient from the deeper ocean back to the uh, 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 erotic zone, so it grows uh, um, much higher productivity and the sinking fluxes. Then previous study just used some uh, 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 observed coral data and they compare with the satellite data that they, they, they are comparable. So why not we just use the satellite debrief curve A. So what we get is very the, uh, a similar pattern of change that indeed it is the high productivity, okay, support the mass and the shell first. But the problem is that why the productivity? Sometimes it will be high like that, sometimes it will be lower, just like that's three times different. Three times different. So, so it just compared to the ONI, Ocean Lake Nino Index, but just make it upside down because uh, you will find that uh, they have the similar pattern of changes. Okay. So it totally controlled by the climate change. And why you be like that? You just take a look at this very uh, strong change of uh, carbon A and mass front. You can see that uh, this is the CDD data. So West Philippine Sea, uh, we use this uh, for the reference and the South China Sea. So start from the 2014, 14, 15, then they are shifting the signal to the right-hand side. So what, what by this mean is that the intrusion of this northern West Pacific Ocean water becomes more and more go into there. But why, why, why go, go in will cause the reduction uh, 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 of the mass flood? It's because if you compare the nutrient, I just take nature as an example, uh, the nutrient in the euphotic zone, West Philippine Sea, is much lower than that in the South China Sea. Okay, this may be 1, one or 0 0.5. This is talking about 5 and over 10. Uh, so it's several times difference. So intrusion of lower nutrient, West Philippine Sea generally, you're reducing the nutrient inventory in the South China Sea. So certainly you have lower productivity, lower mass flood, and when you lower mass flood, you have low, lower shell for me for a shell first. Then we also look at the wind speed because the intrusion of the coral shell also controls by the wind speed. But this is monthly smooth that you can also see the warm face of ONI have a, a lower wind speed. But try to look at the disease and it will be much easier. Similar pattern of changes in the wind speed. So the warm face of the ONI, or the so-called so, uh, so El, El, El Nino years, they have lower wind speed, lower wind speed. All the lower wind speed are related to the warm face of the ONI. And just take, take a look, a 15% reduction of the wind speed, which is from 7.5 mean value to 6.5 something, I'm um, sorry, 60.6 something. 15% reduction in this period you have totally three times reduction in the productivity and also the shell fast. And not to mention, this is the surface and subsurface signal. What we are talking about the signal is in 2,000 and 3,500 meter depth in the South China Sea. And think about the Sea of Japan. So see that the change in the climate, the signal, they have five different ways they transport into the deep ocean of the marginal sea, and which could be very, you can much faster to observe than you can find that in the uh, uh, open ocean. Uh, that, that is my summary, uh, telling that uh, you can find that both the signal have seasonal, very strong seasonal and interannual variability. So we layer to the uh, ANSO, and what more important is that this small put, put Proportional change in the wind speed could have a big change in everything. So, the thing that we find in the 
much of the sea might be happened soon in the open ocean. So I stop here and thank you for uh, your attention. So questions are welcome. We have time for questions. Oh, no questions. I, um, it, it's a great talk, a great, a great study. Um, you have a, a, a data a set going back roughly 20 years, and um, you showed a dramatic, well, a correlation between the observed changes in the deep ocean related to the oscillation indexes. I wondered if you could kind of uh, give your thoughts on how you could extrapolate your findings into the future climate projections that uh, we have been uh, reading in the ICCC, uh, ICCP report. Well, fantastic. Well, we, what we want to do is try to find some empirical equation. If that is, then we can do that uh, uh, as, as what you suggest. That's, we, we really want, uh, want to do that. But what we, what we need is what? Uh, a physical model, <laughs> because I'm a chemical oceanographer. That, uh, that that's called called very 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 paint. But uh, I will try to do it in this way. Yeah. That uh, first is is find the empirical uh, equation between uh, each of the parameter. If it is very robust, then we can try to have it in the other physical modeling. Then we can project the future change. Thank you. Good. Any other? That, that was really interesting. I'm just wondering, are there any um, parallel uh, biological time series that can see whether the communities are responding to these really big changes in flux? Well, un unfortunately, they, they didn't do any... Uh, yes, may, maybe individually some scientists, they, they did such as uh, 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 net trawling or something. But they didn't keep the data in the database, so separate in different uh, scientists. So uh, we don't have such kind of data, to my understanding. Yeah. So any more question or comment? Yeah, please. Yeah, thank you for a very interesting talk. Thank you. Um, I guess my question, I was surprised by the periods where you had no shelf flux in the sediment core or in the sediment trap. Um, and I guess I wonder com if we combine that with some of the pH data you were showing earlier on in the presentation, is it possible that some of that shelf flux is dissolving? Like, because the pH is quite low that you were showing from the Sea of Japan, is it also so low at those deep waters in the South China Sea? Oh, yeah. Uh, we measure the carbon chemistry uh, as well with, during we are departing and taking back the uh, sediment trap. So we have the data. And we have also measured uh, all the carbon chemistry, such as total alkalinity and dissolved inorganic carbon. We all have the data. So. The next step, uh, as what you said, is try to uh, uh, read in this data to see that all of the biogeochemical process, such as that uh, if this, uh, if this uh, mass that uh, if falling down, mean, meanwhile it decomposes and some de uh, dissolved, right? So affecting the uh, 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 chemistry, especially the carbonic chemistry, of water, but we need times to finish it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you very much. So, any more questions? So, you know, thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, unfortunately, next speaker uh, was cancelled, so he couldn't be here. But luckily, we have all morning speakers in this session now, including Roberto and Natalia. So if you have any question to any speakers today, or if you have comment or some discussion about climatic impact on deep sea systems, we can use this time for 
chat thing. So anybody like to speak? Yeah, just a very short comment. I feel like one of the themes that keeps coming up in all of these talks is that the way we thought about climate change impacts in the deep sea as being very short process or very long term processes like 10 years ago, we see more and more examples where it's not always such a long term slow process. And sometimes the changes can be even faster in deep water ecosystems Look at bathial depths Rob showed and so I think it's just a, a real shift in understanding. Maybe the deep sea community already knew that, but when I was in classes 10 years ago, I feel like the deep sea and climate change impacts was always like, worry about that last because changes will be very slow. Yeah, it's a great point. Also, during the morning session, we have quite interesting example in marginal sea, like Mediterranean Sea and Sea of Japan, South China Sea, and also in Corrodo system like Fiordo. It can be quite interesting model system, relatively simple, and uh, we can think from such small system to think about global ocean. And I have a question to Roberto and about the Mediterranean Sea. I know biodiversity suddenly decline because of the global uh, temperature rise in the sea. And as far as I remember, it's related to North Atlantic species into the Mediterranean Sea during colder time, but it's going out during warmer time, at least in nematodes, right? So in such case, during warmer world, Mediterranean endemic species adapted to relatively warm temperature, they are kind of fine, or even them have some trouble with too much high temperature. Okay. You are the friend of mine, but you make difficult questions. Eh? So it's always difficult. The point here is that, uh, uh, first of all, you mentioned nematodes. Um, nematodes forums uh, are largely unknown for their tolerance or preferences. We still have to understand a lot. We are working a lot on functional traits for several species. We are just scraping, you know, a little bit uh, the, 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 the known for the large species, but yet our understanding of the behavior, fin traits, preferences, tolerance, physiology is very, very limited. Um, I guess that uh, more than a, a physiological or specific uh, trait, these small species might be subjected also to a change in currents, a change in the dynamics of the deep sea, uh, which are certainly very strong and we know very little about. Eventually coupled with some uh, bainty storms, huge phenomena spreading and moving. Of course, this is difficult that can explain uh, overall changes, but we don't know even the scale, the spatial scale at which these changes are occurring. So, uh, my impression is that the, uh, for instance, the Mediterranean, which is a semi-closed basin, is uh, receiving a lot of species from the Red Sea, from the Atlantic, and probably, possibly, is also exporting some other species. So, the concept of, of the global ocean is quite evident even there. What we have to understand is that the replacement or the integration of new species is also in the deep sea, is uh, um, posing problems, uh, threatening uh, also the function of deep sea ecosystems, as it is being shown uh, for coastal ecosystems. So I think that the problem of whatever it is, small or large species penetrating in the deep, replacing species, might be an issue in the future. But I don't, I, uh, I don't know if this can be really anticipated, you know, or is just a, a, a false problem because uh, the problem is losing biodiversity, not acquiring new, <laughs> new species. But it, it is also an issue in ecology. There are no uh, empty fields. If we are decreasing biodiversity in the deep, it might be that some shallower species take advantage and maybe penetrate deeper. So I don't know to which extent we can reflect on that, but it's just an idea. Thank you, Roberto. Yeah. Yeah. 
Actually, I had a question for Natalia uh, uh, and her talk. I, I was just curious, do you think that the fjord taxa are more tolerant to oxygen declines because that environment actually periodically does experience hypoxia than say their North Atlantic relatives? I know some of the same species from the North, you know, open ocean live in the fjords, but do you think that there's like local adaptation and, or something like that going on? It's an interesting question. Um, I mean, first of all, fjords select for a really specific subgroup of the species you find offshore. So if, like fjord communities are generally characterized by being high biomass, but pretty low diversity. Like we only have two mesopelagic fish that live in the fjords. They're there in really high biomass, but it's just two. Whereas if you go offshore, the diversity is much higher. So fjords already have a subset of species. Um, maybe those are species that are better at being generalist. Maybe they're, but I don't know that we don't have evidence of local adaptation, at least of these species in the fjords. Um, they're not completely isolated communities, though. Once you get further into the fjords, it's probable that some of the benthic species have more isolation. Um, but probably the fjord communities are more resilient and the species that live there may be more resilient because fjords have these characteristics of going stagnant. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question. Um, I'm a, an economist, so I was listening to your talks and I discovered that uh, there are many uncertainties and knowledge gaps uh, in the different presentations that I heard. Do you think it is a problem to take the science to the policy decision because of those uh, uncertainties or knowledge gaps? Uh, I think policy usually develops with knowledge gaps. And for example, in the fjords, uh, there's so, I mean, so Norway is very proactive about trying to manage marine ecosystems sustainably. So there's a really big focus on that. And uh, as you saw in the talk, there are so many uses for the fjords. So I think that being ready to share the knowledge that we do have before we feel like we have all of the answers is really key to that policy process moving forward. I mean, when are we ever going to have all of the knowledge about the deep sea? If we wait for that, then the policies are going to be put in place without our input. Yeah, I also wanted to, to uh, comment along the same lines uh, of uh, time scales. I think if we are to answer questions about potential evolutionary rescue, um, we should use these um, short-term anomalies like you presented in the MED um, or also fjords and kind of anomalous ecosystems to look at the characteristics of survivors within species. How are they different from, from the mean population in terms of their physiological capabilities and so on? What does, does they, how are they equipped to, to survive uh, deviations from these very homogeneous conditions that are usually in the deep sea? So I think that's really key to use these anomalies. Yeah, good point. Thank you. I, I think we are all on the same line of, of thought these days, which is um, how can we take uh, this short-term variability into our long-term uh, climate projections? And you know, we have seen in the different talks today and in previous uh, studies along along the last ten years that uh, the deep sea is not that stable as we thought before. It changes. It changes a lot. It changes annually, in, it changes interdecadal. So the, the question now is, if uh, deep ocean species are, uh, are capable of coping with these interannual and decadal changes, uh, does that mean that these species will also be able to cope with long-term climate change? And therefore, I raise the question to myself, if our climate projection impacts uh, are correct or if we are kind of overestimating the impacts because we are not considering the species capacity to adapt 
Um, this is just a thought more than a question, but uh, yeah, that's that's is going on on this session today is going around my head for for some time. Thank you. <coughs> so any other points you like to raise? Sure. Uh, my question is to all the speakers, and it's uh, regarding modeling of uh, the future of the deep sea. Uh, many of the CMIP simulations that were shown earlier today are based on one degree models and uh, sea mounts and ridges and so on just tend to be uh, smoothed. Uh, sills tend to be permarized or overflow over sills. And so um, I'm wondering what your thoughts are regarding the priority list of resolving ocean circulation and um, mixing and so on in the deep sea versus some of the uncertainties regarding biological processes uh, that are happening in the deep sea and which matters most from uh, your studies. Thank you. Anybody like to answer? Lisa? <laughs> um, I think it's, it's very well recognized for deep sea organisms that live on hard substrates that they're very sensitive to the topography-induced changes in circulation. We know less about the responses to the non-topography-induced changes in circulation, but it's hard to imagine that there isn't a response, even in flat sediments, that, you know, when the currents speed up, the, the taxa change or their, you know, condition changes and they get less or more food. So um, I think we're probably at really early stages of linking those two things with model, you know, in the modeling world. But I think it's a, something to aim for. Thank you, Lisa. <coughs> we, we also need to be okay. <laughs> just, just to follow up, I, I, to be honest, I didn't quite understand your question, but it's my problem, not your problem. But uh, I think in terms of, for example, taking the North, exam North Atlantic as an example, it's kind of, uh, most of most models already show that there's probably, there will probably be a, um, a slowdown of the AMOC current, and slowing down the AMOC current will bring, uh, for example, colder water from the north a bit south, and there, there's some examples, because of the slowdown of the AMOC current, that some areas in the North Atlantic will see the, the bottom temperature decrease and not really increase. So the models that the climate projection models for the deep ocean that we use, I think already consider uh, some of the changes on the, on, the, on, the climate, on the current system that we will observe or we might likely observe uh, in, in the future, mostly in areas like the North Atlantic. And when we take um, the, the water mass properties and the change of the properties in the water mass that includes not only temperature increase, uh, oxygen, oxygen uh, concentration changes, uh, aragonite saturation, uh, horizon saturation changes, and, and so forth. And when we put all this information into, for example, habitat suitability models and these kind of things, we really see a, a response of deep water organisms to those changes. And um, including, for example, the reduction of suitable habitat for corals and sponges and the migration towards the, the north, well, the poles of, of fish, for example. And, uh, and then when, when we ask uh, our colleagues around, and uh, Ron, I think she's not in the room anymore, uh, it's a colleague from Iceland, when we were projections, the, projected these changes, for example, on, on deep water fish movement, they were already observing uh, those species appearing in their Icelandic waters in the last five to ten years. So there's probably coincidence, but there's, probably, there's also kind of a, a, an hypothesis that the projections are not that wrong and can be used. The, the current and climate projections are not that wrong and can be used to make some inferences into what is happening already with these changes in the climate. Sorry. <laughs> I, was I think we need to, to finish. We're well into our lunch hour. So okay, okay. Sorry, know. time and, is and finishing. Everybody should come back at, at uh, 11, at 1.30 yeah, to yeah. continue. Yeah. So, so okay. thank you for who you are. Thank you.
Hello, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the second part of our deep sea uh, responses to and solutions to climate change uh, in, the, um, in this, in this uh, symposium. Uh, I will be chairing, my name is Talmo Marato, I'm from the University of the Azores, which are some islands in the middle of North Atlantic, um, and I'll be sharing the, the, the afternoon session for you today. Uh, so thank you very much for, for joining us. Um, we will start right away. We have three more uh, talks and then a short discussion, uh, a plenary discussion. We will start with uh, a PhD student from University of Washington, Elena, uh, and sorry for if I pronounce wrongly the, the last name, Mac Maragall, uh, and she will uh, present a talk on the uncertainty in fish-mediated carbon transport into the ocean twilight zone. All right, thank you so much for that introduction. Thank you to all of you for coming. I hope you had a nice lunch. And thank you to my collaborators shown here. So I'm here to talk about our research related to the role that fish play in carbon cycling in the ocean, and also our findings related to the enormous uncertainty associated with this process. So what we do know is that uh, the oceans absorb about a quarter of our carbon dioxide emissions. And um, this happens in large part thanks to passive carbon transport. So this is the process in which um, the sea surface equilibrates with the atmosphere. Carbon dioxide is incorporated via photosynthesis into phytoplankton. And then some of those phytoplankton die and sink um, out of the epiplagic zone uh, past 200 meters into the mesoplagic zone or the twilight zone. A much lesser studied mechanism of carbon export out of the epiplagic is this process of dial vertical migration. So shown in white here are the billions of organisms all over the world's ocean that, does, that do this. And so basically they're down in the mesoplagic zone hiding from visual predators during the day. And then as the sun sets, they rise up and um, come up to the sea surface where there's a higher abundance of food. They fill their stomachs with organic carbon and then they dive back down into the mesoplagic zone. And once they're down there, they release a lot of this carbon that they've consumed through three main pathways, their respiration, their uh, ingestion, and their mortality when they're predated on by things that remain in the deep sea. So if we imagine that this purple arrow represents the total carbon transported by the biological carbon pump, this is the active plus passive transport, and this red arrow represents um, just the contribution of fish to carbon export, what we see in the literature is that um, in some papers, uh, fish may be contributing about 1% of total carbon export. And in other papers, there's an estimated about 30% contribution of fish. So this is a huge range across studies. And if you look closely within each study, there's also quite a bit of um, uncertainty within each of those estimates. And so what we wanted to do was to get to the bottom of what is causing this um, huge uncertainty in the outcome of these carbon uh, flux models for fish. And so we made this model. Um, this is representing just a single uh, migrating fish uh, where we know the biomass of that individual, so we're not looking at biomass uncertainty, just bioenergetic and movement uncertainty. And so we have these fish migrating up and down past our chosen flux boundary of 200 meters. Um, and then we have these non-migrators that we also include in the model. So we have one migrator, one non-migrator. And uh, these, in part, eat migrating zooplankton. So if they weren't consuming those zooplankton, they would swim back up and release some of their carbon at the sea surface. So that's why we include non-migrators as well as part of this um, fish carbon transport. And so, again, we have this adjustion flux. We have a mortality and respiration flux. And all of this contributes to fish carbon transport. But what's not shown here, because it's be too much going on, is that there's about 30 different parameters associated across these three different carbon flux pathways for migrators and then also for non-migrators. So as you can imagine, this doesn't produce a very precise estimate of fish carbon flux because each of those 30 parameters have an have a, um, uncertain um, value. So we basically ran a sensitivity analysis using a Monte Carlo simulation to propagate all the uncertainty through all these different parameters. And this revealed some of the most highly influential parameters, which we found were 
uh, the respiration rate um, intercept and slope. So uh, we got respiration rate from this allometric regression uh, where respiration rate is um, predicted by fish mass, um, the temperature of the water that the fish is in, and the fish taxon. So are they migrators or non-migrators? And um, these data here show the regression from Ikea 2016 that is all the respiration rate measurements um, that we have across the literature for mesoplagic fish. So by their mass, this is their predicted respiration rate at their routine metabolic rate. So this is somewhere in between their, their minimum and maximum metabolic rate. And so if we you know, vary that intercept and slope just a little bit, we get a really different outcome for fish carbon transport. Another uh, highly influential parameter related to the respiration rates of these fish is their activity scaling factor, as we call it. So this is how much you scale up or down that respiration rate when they're actively swimming or migrating or foraging versus when they're in the mesopelagic zone where they're often assumed to be um, at a lower metabolic state. Um, there's not a lot of evidence for this in the literature, so we let that vary quite a bit in the sensitivity analysis. Um, next, related to not the respiratory but the adjustion pathway, one of the most important parameters was this fecal pellet export ratio. So this is just what percentage of the waste released by these fish sinks below the chosen flux boundary, in this case 200 meters. And this, again, is just looking at an individual fish, ignoring biomass. So the next step was to take this into the field and actually consider a real place and time um, and considering all the biomass of the fish um, in, that, in that place. And so to do this, we went out um, into the field to this site shown here called the Porcupine Abyssal Plain. There's a long time series um, operating at this study site, so it was a great place to choose. We went out with these three different ships. Two came from Southampton. We came from Vigo, Spain. And um, the ship shown in the front here is the Sarmiento de Gamboa. And then the RV Cook in the middle was uh, our two ships were collecting fish and, and zooplankton biomass using um, two different sizes of the same net. And that net um, to measure biomass that we used is this mock nest. This is a multiple opening and closing net and environmental sensing system. And so with this net, um, what's really great about it is you can use it at night and open and close nets at different depths to get an idea of how many fish are migrating versus not migrating. We did this for zooplankton as well. Um, and the next thing we wanted to do at sea was try to measure some of these important parameters. So we measured respiration rates of as many fish as we could. And these fish were collected near the sea surface, so um, they weren't undergoing a huge pressure change before we measured them. And then we put all of this into this uh, fish carbon flux model that we talked about earlier, but now including the entire catch, the entire biomass estimate at the study site. So this lets us compare fish flux to passive, uh, to total carbon flux, because those, uh, those other ships were measuring all different pathways of carbon transport. So we were able to compare the fish flux divided by the total passive plus active transport to get the percent contribution of fish at um, two different flux boundaries, 200 meters, so the top of the mesoplagic zone, and 500 meters, which is um, considered more of a carbon sequestration depth. So some of our findings so far are um, that biomass is indeed an an another huge source of uncertainty. This is showing from the RV Cook, um, one of the, the ship that had the smaller of the two nets, uh, variability just between uh, some of the toes. So you can see in, in like toe one, there's about twice as much fish caught as in um, some of the other ones. So this is about a twofold variation just due to patchiness and how they're distributed. And then there's also this roughly tenfold variation um, or uncertainty in the capture efficiency of these nets. So we don't really know if these nets are catching closer to 10% or, or closer to 100% of the fish caught. It's probably not 100%, but um, this isn't really well quantified in the literature, so we have a big range there. Um, and so related to that capture efficiency, this is a great opportunity to try to um, dial that in because we have these two different nets, the larger um, 10 meters squared opening mock nest and the smaller 1 meter squared, and this is showing the size distribution and frequency so we can get an idea of how much more efficient is one net than the other. Um, these data actually aren't standardized yet by volume, so this is just sort of for demonstration. That's the next step. Um, then 
as we were talking about earlier, the bioenergetics contribute a lot of uncertainty as well. This is about a fourfold uncertainty. This is mainly, again, due to uncertainty, um, parameter uncertainty in the respiratory and adjustion fluxes. So these are the data shown in purple that we collected for mctophids, one of the mesopelagic fishes out there. Um, and as you can see, these data points are quite a bit higher than the routine metabolic rate that we would have predicted otherwise with this regression. Um, and so as this is a, on a non-log scale about five times higher than the routine metabolic rate we would have predicted from the literature. And it's possible that this is because we were measuring these fish very shortly after they were collected, so they could have still been startled more compared to some of the literature data that are collected after an acclimation period. Um, but also, this was during the North Atlantic spring bloom, so these fish had a lot of food, and that's a, a, a big difference from the literature experiments where the fish are often starved when they're measured. So in the end, we estimate that uh, these fish may be contributing only about 0.4% to the total carbon transport at, at this particular study site in the spring, or potentially as much as 20%. Uh, so as you can see, this is a huge uncertainty range. And I think the bottom line here is that the closer we look, the more we realize it's really hard to precisely estimate this, this part of the carbon cycle. And so this is both an exciting opportunity to um, constrain these estimates uh, by prioritizing which parameters we do additional empirical measurements on. Um, but in the meantime, I think it's really important that we communicate honestly about uh, what we know and don't know about the magnitude of this process. So some next steps. Um, we'd like to look at uh, using data from the other ship that we're focusing on zooplankton as well. What is the additional contribution of fish beyond the contribution of zooplankton? Um, or, I'm sorry, beyond that of their zooplankton prey. So imagine that you take a fish out of the environment, how much carbon is still being transported by their prey? Um, and then also to think about uh, how long is this fish carbon being sequestered from the atmosphere? That's what, uh, you know, what a lot of people are really interested in. And so to do this, we can use um, a study like this one from Dave Siegel et al., 2021, where they looked at, um, so on the bottom is the proportion of carbon that's stored at the depth shown at the top, 200 meters, for 100 years. So um, at our study site, that I'm, study site that I'm pointing to here, about 20% of carbon that makes its way past 200 meters is, is estimated to be stored for this climate-relevant timescale of 100 years. Um, this would be different at the, other, at the other flux boundary that we'd like to look at um, of 500 meters, but... Um, yeah, I think it's important to think about the storage times as well, um, which uh, in some cases uh, not a lot of carbon is stored uh, for a long time scale at this, at this 200 meter boundary, which a lot of the papers on fish carbon flux use. So uh, thank you so much to my funding sources, uh, to more collaborators and um, researchers than I can even list here, and uh, to all of you for listening. Thank you very much, Elena, for a great talk. Thank I you. think uh, we have time for a couple of questions. Uh, we had one in the back. No? Yeah. Super nice talk, thanks. thanks. Uh, also illustrating the, uh, the challenges. I was surprised to see that you could actually incubate, do shipboard incubation on, on that code, uh, mesopelagics, which is... Uh, a challenge in its own. Um, do you have any acoustic observations from the ships that you, where you could use your size distribution and species composition from the net trolls to hopefully get some of the spatial and uh, spatial variability and the catchability issues? Thank you. That's a, that's a great question. Um, we do have acoustics. So um, actually on our ship, it's, uh, it, they weren't working well, but on one of the other ships that was in the same place and time for much of the cruise, we have acoustic data. And um, I think the challenge that many people here in the room know more about than I do is converting from acoustic uh, to you know, biomass estimates. And so the target strengths of these fish are not well known. Some have swim bladders, some don't. We don't know that super well, but it makes a big difference for the acoustics. So converting to biomass is, is, a, is a bit of a challenge. or might not constrain that biomass uncertainty any further than the nets can. But the acoustics are great for some of the other parameters in the model, like how deep are they migrating, 
Um, how quickly are they swimming as they move up and down? So definitely, the acoustics have informed some of these parameters in the model. Okay, thank you. I yeah. think we have to Sounds move. Sounds good. Thank uh, you. We are um, getting a bit late, one minute. So um, please, thank you again. Uh, welcome the next speaker, Lisa Levin from the Scripps uh, Institute of Oceanography. Lisa, um, it's a well-known deep sea uh, scientist, and she will talk about um, deep sea consequences of ocean-based climate interventions. Thank you, Lisa. Okay, thanks, Tomo. Um, so, so today I wanna talk about ocean-based climate interventions from the perspective of the deep sea. And those of you who were in the session, the CDR session yesterday, might have noticed there was like no mention of the deep sea very little mention of the seafloor and not even that much mention of environmental impacts. But you can tell from my title, mitigation or mutilation, really what, what we're gonna be talking about today. Oh, let me go back and just say, I need to acknowledge my 12 co-authors on this. Um, a number of them are in the room with me today. Um, so really this was a group effort and what I'm going to be doing is uh, presenting basically a paper that we published last month um, with a much tamer title. Uh, <laughs> you know, I don't remember if science took away our, t our original title. But anyway, the main message of this paper is the second line that um, ocean manipulations to mitigate climate change might harm deep sea ecosystems. And for those of you in the C CDR session, you're gonna be very familiar with why we're talking about this. Um, a number of IPCC reports um, that came out have indicated that we must reach net zero or net negative carbon dioxide emissions to achieve the goal of the Paris Agreement, which is to keep warming below at or below 1.5 degrees C. And the reports say that this will require active CO2 removal. So the first report to say this was the special report on global warming of 1.5. And they said they project that the use of um, carbon dioxide removal will be necessary. And then just last month, the AR6 synthesis report came out and once again told us that carbon dioxide removal will be necessary to achieve net zero, uh, net negative CO2 emissions. So we're this is why this conversation is ramping up so quickly. And most of our climate intervention efforts um, to date have been terrestrial, but people are now looking very much at the ocean. And the question is, if we look at the ocean uh, for carbon dioxide removal, where do we put it? And if we look at the global ocean carbon cycle, you will see that by far the biggest repository of carbon is in the deep sea. There's 44 times more carbon in the deep ocean than there is in the atmosphere. And so the deep sea has become a deposition, a deposition site of choice. So there are a number of relatively well accepted uh, climate interventions that uh, focus on shallow water. Enhancement of coastal blue carbon, um, building up mangroves and uh, seabed ecosystems, or um, more recently, concern with conservation of these and restoration of these habitats. But, um, but we know, and, and people have been talking even at this meeting, about the fact that the amount of carbon that can be sequestered by these coastal ecosystems is very small compared to what we need to remove. And so people are looking at alternatives. Oh, there, sorry. the co carbon conservation and restoration has been, again, looked at in the coastal zone, not in the open ocean so much. But, but there are many other approaches suggested and um, surface albedo enhancement um, to cool the atmosphere and to cool the ocean uh, uh, involve a whole suite of technologies. I've listed a couple of them here, cloud brightening and micro bubble dispersion. Um, use of the ocean to create renewable energy called uh, thermal, uh, using thermal gradients is called OTEC, and this has um, been proposed. There's artificial upwelling to stimulate primary production and draw down CO2. There's artificial downwelling to um, draw down CO2 rich waters into uh, deeper to remove them. Um, so these have all been proposed as mitigation tools. 
A number of other techniques are uh, focus on enhancing primary production, including ocean fertilization, uh, iron fertilization, to stimulate phytoplankton growth, which then sinks into the deep sea, or macroalgal culture, and sinking, uh, which then um, sinks into the deep sea or can be baled and sunk. But there's there's others. Uh, people are looking at baling crop waste or uh, wood chips and sinking them into the deep sea. And there's also proposals to put liquid carbon, and maybe it's already happening, to put liquid carbon dioxide, inject it into either deep midwaters or onto the seafloor surface or to put it subsurface. So, um, and the reason, and, and everybody's looking at putting all of these things below a thousand meters because carbon can stay out of the atmosphere for more than a hundred years. You can see, um, for, again, from a seagull um, model that uh, the residence time of carbon at a thousand meters varies depending on which ocean basin you're in. It also varies a lot with, with water depth. So these are all considerations. But there are other, um, there are even more carbon removal technologies. Um, ocean alkalinity enhancement, um, is, which is the addition of ground up silicates and carbonates, um, has been proposed to uh, basically increase alkalinity, draw down more CO2. Electrochemical processes have been proposed to separate CO2 rich waters and move them down. So all of these could. Um, and, and produce hydrogen, but all of these could help address ocean acidification as well as uh, warming. So there, there's a lot of interest in these. So nearly all of the technologies that I mentioned, if applied at scale sufficient to mitigate climate change, would have consequences for deep sea environments and for deep sea biodiversity. And uh, this figure then uh, tries to summarize uh, these many different kinds of consequences. I'm just going to run through them quickly. We know that um, increased uh, ocean reflectivity or maybe covering the surface of the ocean with masses of algae is going to change um, light penetration and productivity if we add particles through OAE will get increased turbidity. And all of these changes, well, and, and those particles, um, the, the silicates and, and um, carbonates also might bring toxic metals into uh, the water. And all of, uh, and uh, there are techniques that will enhance productivity, which will sink. Phytoplankton sinking will decay. They will, de that will deplete oxygen and release CO2 and uh, basically leading, enhancing deoxygenation and acidification in midwaters. And all of these different effects, changes in light and chemist, biogeochemistry will affect the midwater, mesopelagic communities, perhaps the vertical migration that we just heard about. Um, there are a lot of unknowns there. We know that the sinking of crop waste and kelp will lease, release a lot of dissolved organic mat material, it will change microbial production. Um, all of these different things will change food supply at the deep sea floor. Um, and that change in food supply, including piles of algae on the sea floor, will change uh, sometimes aggregate species, change species interactions, um, possibly cause, uh, well, almost certainly cause anoxia underneath the accumulated piles, can smother benthic fauna, um, maybe release hydrogen sulfide and release other greenhouse gases like nitrous oxide or methane. Um, the injection of CO2 into deep waters or onto the seafloor can actually kill or smother the invertebrates and fish and ca or cause hypercapnia. So we don't really have pictures of what any of this looks like at scale on the deep sea floor. I can't show you, but we can imagine it by looking at the beaches of Martinique, which have been covered, you know, what does it look like when dead algae covers the seafloor? Well, it might look like that, where sargassum has piled up and, and totally covered the beaches. Or CO2 injection might look like these brine lakes with massive microbial mats where CO2 is naturally coming out of the seafloor. 
So research on all these technologies is in very early stages, and the Hippocratic Oath of do no harm has been adopted by, uh, as a guiding principle by several groups. HUI and SIO have a consortium developing a code of conduct, and the EU Recovery and Resilience Facility has also adopted the, this um, principle. And um, the co-authors on our paper have wanted to point out that many of the different impacts that I've been talking about actually counter the sustainable development goals, which are trying to tackle pollution, acidification, to working towards maintaining ecosystem integrity. So we have to be really careful on this front. So I, I want to talk just a little bit uh, about um, governance, regulation of these interventions um, as they affect the deep sea is actually quite uncertain. We know that each state will be um, regulating activities within its own exclusive economic zone, but the London Convention and London Protocol also regulates what we can dump into the ocean. And so things like ocean alkalinity enhancement will be regulated by um, the London Convention and Protocol, um, and um, in fact, iron fertilization, uh, the introduction of nutrients like iron has, um, is, is regulated by Annex 4 of the London Protocol, but it hasn't come into force yet because not enough countries have ratified that annex. Um, annex 1, which governs organic waste, um, would probably regulate dumping of crop waste or maybe bailing and dumping of, of um, macroalgae, but we don't know for sure. Um, the Lenin Convention has not allowed the injection of liquid CO2. Um, let's see. Oh, yeah, and a, bu a bunch of question marks for some of these other activities. Nobody's regulating OTEC, artificial upwelling and downwelling, and, and maybe even some of the macroalgal activities in international waters. But we do have a new treaty. Many of you are familiar with the BBNJ or, or High Seas Treaty. And it may um, regulate impact assessment, data transparency, um, and capacity development in ways that could help us deal with all of these different activities internationally. So who can guide research effectiveness on, uh, and impacts of these technologies? I'm running out of time, so I'm going to very quickly say that I think the IPCC and GASAMP have a role. The, ocean de the Decade for Ocean Science has a role, and I've listed up two of their new centers that are dealing with climate interventions. Um, we need standardized data. We need a data clearinghouse for everybody to share, and we need a lot of partnerships, and, and we need really interdisciplinary consortia to work on this problem, bringing together observationalists, experimentalists, and, uh, and, uh, and modelers. And we need more than just natural science. We need the social sciences and economics and legal considerations uh, to become part of this, just as we need local communities and traditional knowledge to be engaged. So that's a really tall order. Um, and so I'm going to leave you with this. This is my last slide to show you the, um, po the, the policy scape. You know, the mandate to address all this comes from the UNFCCC. I think the regulation comes from the London Convention and Protocol, the impact assessment from BBNJ Treaty, the science, hopefully, from the decade, Gazamp and all of us. Um, uh, but, but there's going to need to be more. Somebody's got to protect biodiversity out there. Might be the CBD. Somebody's got to protect the fisheries out there. Might be the FAO and the regional fisheries. Um, you know, there will be intersection with seabed mining, with shipping, and, and uh, you know, in general, we need to um, embrace the, the sustainable development goals. Um, so this is a really tall order, but I think this is what we're looking at for the future. Thank you. <laughs> no, I guess I can. I, is there any time for a question or no? <laughs> I think we have time for one quick question from the audience, if you have. Um, if no question, I have one. Uh, Sorry, <laughs> if I may. You listed very well um, and, and analyzed very well all the, the implications of um, of the climate solutions, but I wondered uh, if, if you evaluate what could be the spatial scales of those impacts. If you are talking about one, one you know, a very patchy 
type of, of, um, of mitigation or it's kind of spread throughout, expected to be at a larger scale? Um, well, different technologies will have different scales of impact and durations of impact, probably, time and space scales. So, so that's a really good question. But, I'm, you know, the, the ones that people have been able to visualize are like kelp fields the size of whole countries, you know, covering the ocean, um, or even fertilization patches the size, you know, really, really large scales is what's going to be required if we want to have any um, impact on uh, climate. Now, there are a lot of startups that will sell carbon uh, credits for really small scale activities. And, you know, we may see more of that. So, you know, sinking of crop waste or wood chips in one location over, you know, 10 kilometers or something like that. But a lot of these others are going to be on a really massive scale. So. Okay, thank you, Lisa. Um, we are coming close to the, <clears throat> to the final talk of this session. Uh, it will be uh, a v recorded uh, by video. Um, it was prepared by uh, David uh, van der Zwag from Dalhousie University, and he will, we will show you a video on climate change and governance of the Central Arctic Ocean. We hope it works. Governance of the Central Arctic Ocean is my presentation. Retreating and thinning sea ice has placed the Central Arctic Ocean, a large donor hole of high seas underlying seabed, on the political and public radar screens. Prospects of increased shipping and possible development of a transpolar shipping route. You see that green line uh, over the top of the Arctic uh, might open in coming decades, and potential future commercial fisheries as well. Uh, and we see decreasing sea ice there on the figure to the left. Planted a Russian flag in the North Pole in August 2007 unleashed a media frenzy over perceived scramble for Arctic resources, including mineral resources. And of course, the scramble is not really true, but that's what the media said. And governance of the Cyclotic Ocean is a focus of my presentation, but two images help to capture the realities. Cooperative currents, two layers of cooperative streaming stand out, global agreements and developments relevant to the Arctic Ocean marine conservation, and regional eddies. And then finally, a foggy future, very unsettled law and policy future with four uncertainties to be flagged very quickly. A two-part speed cruise follows. So first of all, cooperative currents. Three main global streams continue to flow. First of all, the law of the sea is the overarching framework, and I call it the mainstream. Here, the 1982 law of the sea convention provides many guiding currents. Various freedoms of the high seas open to all states, including freedoms of navigation, fishing, and marine scientific research. Flag state jurisdiction prevails as the prime principle for controlling activities, and various responsibilities would fall upon states to control activities of their vessels and national and the high seas. Uh, just a few examples, generally protect and preserve the marine environment, to conserve high seas fish stocks, to cooperate with other states in seeking to manage fish stocks jointly exploited, undertaking a vital impact assessment for planned activities that may cause substantial pollution or significant harmful changes to the marine environment, and take necessary measures to protect and preserve rare, fragile ecosystems and habitat of threatened or endangered marine species. Uh, the Law of the Sea Convention recognizes the right of coastal states to claim extended continental shelves uh, beyond 200 nautical miles to the edge of the continental margin, which includes sovereign rights then over mineral and non-living uh, re uh, resources and, and as well sedentary species. A mineral exploration and exploitation of deep seabed beyond national jurisdiction would come under the jurisdiction of the international seabed authority. We have the 1995 UN Fish Stocks Agreement establishes various obligations potentially relevant to the Arctic high seas, uh, application precautionary ecosystem approaches, and it has a commitment to establish sub-regional regional fisheries management organization or arrangement where no such organization arrangement exists for a particularly straddling or highly migratory fish stock. Uh, there's a new agreement, of course, on the conservation sustainable use of marine biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction. Uh, and it promises to add a cooperative currents with new provisions on marine genetic resource access and benefit sharing, the establishment of MPAs on the high seas and other area-based management tools, and environmental impact assessment. A second major global stream are numerous international maritime organization agreements and guidelines applicable to the Central Arctic Ocean. Uh, we have a polar shipping code, which does apply to the Central Arctic Ocean, sets new safety and pollution control measures, 
including zero pollution, for example, from oil, from ships. And then we have a heavy fuel oil ban uh, for Arctic shipping uh, as well that will come into force in July uh, 2024, with some exceptions uh, for ships, for example, in search and rescue, and for those ships undertaking a pollution prevention preparedness and response. Uh, we also have multilateral environmental agreements, particularly, for example, the Convention on Biological Diversity. Uh, for example, under that convention, each party required to cooperate with other contracting parties in achieving conservation, sustainable use of biodiversity in areas beyond national jurisdiction. And the CBD Secretary in 2014 helped convene an Arctic Regional Workshop to facilitate description of what they call ecologically or biologically significant marine areas. And they identified then two EPSAs in the Central Arctic Ocean, the multi-year ice in the Central Arctic Ocean, and the dynamic marginal ice zone in the Central Arctic Ocean as well, having open water periods in summer. We also have regional cooperative eddies. Uh, we have three regional trees negotiated uh, by Arctic Council task forces, uh, and they apply them to the Central Arctic Ocean. You have the agreement on uh, cooperation, maritime search and rescue, agreement on cooperation, marine oil pollution preparedness and response, and agreement on enhancing international Ar Arctic scientific cooperation. We also have broader Arctic 5 plus 5 regional cooperation on Central Arctic Ocean fisheries. Uh, that's a agreement was adopted uh, in 2018 by the Arctic Five coastal states plus China, Japan, South Korea, Iceland, and the uh, European Union with various commitments, uh, not authorizing flight vessels to conduct commercial fishing in the Central Arctic Ocean as conservation management measures have been adopted by one or more regional or sub-regional fisheries management organizations or arrangements or pursuant to other measures that may be adopted by parties under the agreement. Established within three years of entry into the force of the agreement, conservation and management measures for exploratory fishing, and adopting within two years the agreements into a force, a joint program on scientific research and monitoring, and a data sharing protocol. Convening meetings every, at least every two years to review agreement implementation, consider whether it commits negotiations to establish one or more uh, additional regional, regional, sub-regional fishery management organization uh, or arrangement. Uh, that agreement, of course, uh, was entered open for signature in Greenland, in October 2018, entered into force in 25 June 2021, and you had the first meeting of the uh, parties uh, in November 2022 in South Korea. Finally, the, the foggy future. Now, I'll give you a fast four uh, quickly flagged. Uh, first of all, sorting out the future of Central Arctic Ocean Fisheries uh, Governance. Um, the Fisheries Agreement raises numerous implementation challenges, for example, working out the scientific cooperation details, Clarifying the condition for exploratory fishing, sorting out when commencement of negotiations for a new RFMO or arrangement might be appropriate. For example, what constitutes adequate scientific information? How is precautionary approach to be applied? And finally, fleshing out indigenous rights and interests uh, that also have to be addressed. Tough questions could be faced if commercially viable fish stocks are ever found, and that's very doubtful, by the way. Uh, should a commercialization future be pursued, even if commercially exploitable stocks are identified? One or more no-take areas might actually benefit or be favored by coastal states in case of straddling fish stocks. And the sui generis, very unique nature of Central Arctic Ocean could justify a unique international protective response. Let's not open commercial fishing at all to that area. And if commercial fishing is allowed, what should be the access and allocation criteria? A second fog area is deciding on future steps within the International Maritime Organization to address Central Arctic Ocean shipping. Uh, the Arctic Council's uh, Protection of Arctic Marine Environment Working Group has taken a lead in considering future directions, but without specific decisions or recommendations. Uh, this PAIN Working Group in 2014 did support a Norwegian study uh, that laid out some options, uh, including, for example, uh, a particularly sensitive sea area for the whole Central Arctic Ocean, or maybe uh, particular PSSAs, particularly sensitive sea areas, uh, along with uh, some regulatory measures, such as areas to be uh, avoided, uh, perhaps mandatory ship reporting. Uh, two further payment-related reports addressing Central Arctic Ocean governance and shipping have yet to be finalized. We have uh, one report uh, be, still being uh, undertaken by ICES Pisces Payne Working Group on Integrated Assessment for the Central Arctic Ocean. And then there's also a PAME synthesis report on ecosystem status, human impacts, and management measures in the Central Arctic Ocean. Uh, both of those will have management measures that will be addressed on the Central Arctic Ocean, uh, but again, those reports are not available yet. 
And finally, determine extended continental shelves uh, boundaries in the Arctic and development seabed development futures. Uh, only Norway has completed the Commission on the Limits of the Continental Shelf process. Uh, you'll see the extended uh, area there in shaded. Canada made its Arctic submission to the Commission on the Limits of the Continental Shelf in May 2019, uh, with a further addendum in December 2022. Denmark Greenland has filed its various submissions as well. Uh, Russian Federation made its initial submission, uh, wasn't quite good enough, and had to go back and do more homework. And they came back with an additional submission in 2015 and addenda in March 2021 and a further partial revision in February 2023. Bottom line, Canada, Denmark, Greenland, and Russia all claim the North Pole. USA, USA is not a party to the Law of the Sea Convention and therefore may not be eligible to submit its claim off Alaska, Commission on the Limits of the Continental Shelf. And the future remains foggy as the policy approaches of the Arctic Five, the future developments on extended continental shelves in the Central Arctic Ocean. Will it be a mineral exploration exploitation future, a marine conservation future, or perhaps a mix? A large part of what's called the Gackle Ridge stands out as one area almost certain to lie beyond national jurisdiction in light of the Commission on the Limits of the Continental Shelf recommendations on the Russian claim issued on 6 February 2023. Uh, that area is about 75,000 square nautical miles on a small area, uh, and future governance remains uncertain then. Uh, again, would it go back to the International Seabed Authority for regulation? Uh, might there be a special agreement uh, by states to protect that area? Uh, or would, would there be some kind of mining future? And finally, uh, see how a new global agreement on biodiversity on national jurisdiction will apply to the Central Arctic Ocean. Um, we have this new agreement uh, that was agreed to in principle, at least in March of, of this year. Uh, just an example, it provides for establishment of NPAs and other area-based measures on the high seas uh, and through nominations from parties. There'll be a review process for those nominations and a decision eventually by conference of the parties. So then it remains questionable then whether that global process will be able to use to address regional protected areas in the Arctic, particularly in relation to fisheries, shipping, and possibly mining beyond national jurisdiction. Uh, the Conference of the Parties must respect the competencies of and not undermine relevant legal instruments and frameworks and relevant global, regional, sub-regional, receptoral bodies. Conference of the Parties may recommend protective measures, competent global, regional, sub-regional, sectoral bodies. Quite complicated, so no one really knows yet exactly how this new agreement will apply to the Central Arctic Ocean. Conclusion, one final nautical image captures the bottom line regarding governance in the Central Arctic Ocean beyond national jurisdiction an unfinished voyage. I'll stop there and hope we'll have some time for a few questions uh, from the audience. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, David is, is not online. I tried to chat uh, with him during, during the talk. So unfortunately, he will not be able to answer the, your questions now. Uh, but if you have some, please write on the app, on the application, and hopefully it will uh, get back to you. So we now have uh, the last 15 minutes of general discussion. And for that, um, Lisa, I will hand over to you. But again, thank you for joining us. Please stay uh, an extra 15 minutes um, to see what are uh, the key messages that we are all taking from this session. Okay. Well, thanks to all our speakers. This was really an interesting and provocative session. And I think, you know, there's, there's so much to say about the deep sea. I, I actually am going to ask you guys a couple of questions that are um, the conference organizers are asking all the session leads to answer. <laughs> and since we have to answer those sometime by the end of our session, I thought um, I'd put it out there to, to the audience. So um, one of these questions is, what are the current trends in the study of climate and deep ocean? In other words, the current trends in the disciplines that were discussed today. And the second question is, what are the major knowledge gaps in this area? So, um, you know, we've heard, I think we've heard about a, a lot of trends today, you know, this morning and this afternoon, and, and we've also heard of some knowledge gaps. But I, I'd like to know what the audience or any of the speakers think are really the 
prior, ought to be the priorities. I think uh, one of the gap is that when you observe the change, right? Uh, but how to identify whether the, cha the change is due to anthropogenic or natural variability? Thank you. That's a really good one. I hope the other session chairs are taking notes since I can't when I'm walking around. <laughs> so um, did, uh, did everybody hear that? You know, distinguishing anthropogenic from natural variability in, in the deep ocean. Other thoughts? Yeah. Um, thank you. I'm not a deep sea biologist or ecologist or uh, I don't work with deep sea, but uh, for all this uh, discussion that we have during the, these days, I saw that there is a discrepancy between the um, climate change velo velocity uh, from land to the sea. And uh, I guess that there may be a lot of lag in uh, knowledge in, in this framework for the deep sea especially because the deep sea uh, may have a delay or a further delay in the response in the first place and in a second place maybe the deep sea um, as a different so as a diff, uh, as a, an acceleration so as a um, rebound uh, like an over, overshot uh, um, in um, in temperature and, uh, and finally, heavier uh, impact due to the stability that normally uh, has. Yeah, I think we, ha we had a, quite a few talks that, in fact, implied that while we expect a really long lag time for the deep sea to respond, you know, slow velocities, that maybe it's much faster, especially the deep sea areas that are closer to the continental margins. So. Um, or, you know, to human activity as well. Other thoughts? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I'm, com I'm coming from a marine institute, and we are asked by the government uh, what, what area, area should we protect and close, 30 by 30 and all of that, and, and that's about protecting biodiversity. And we really feel that there is this lack of information on, on ecosystem functioning and connectivity that we would really need to, and biodiversity, that we need to be able to make informed decisions on and advise our government as best as possible on both shallow and the deep sea protection areas. So, yes, we need definitely more information on that. I think you're spot on about that. And there's so many decisions may, being made right now about deep sea bed mining, about new fisheries, about you know, climate interventions, it's like such a really active policy time for the deep sea without, and, and these are really important gaps. Yeah, so this is more a comment or a question to something you said in, in, in your talk and referring to the UN and, 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 and funding agency and that nothing shall be done that will harm the environment. And then I wonder, is that an expectation to me as a marine scientist that I shall be against anything that can harm the environment? Is that for the politicians to, to, to decide? And I shall be clean in my way of thinking and be against everything. Because, I mean, we, we, everybody knows about the, 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 the trade-off here. And I was a bit surprised that that was stated so clearly. Okay, well, you're right in pointing out this conflict because there are codes of conduct that say do not harm, do no harm. Okay, that's the Hippocratic Oath. And um, you also are totally correct that we're going to have trade offs to tackle climate change. There's, we're going to have to do a lot of things, and some of them are probably going to harm the environment. So we're going to have to figure out which environments are we willing to harm? How much harm are we willing to do? How long do we want that harm? You know, how long should that harm last? Those are clearly um, problems. It's a problem we're going to face. So what I'm hearing from you is that we, 
I'm not advocating that everybody adopt do no harm. All right, I'm just saying it's, it's a way of thinking that has evolved for um, some of the groups that are tackling climate interventions. And if, if that's a guiding principle, it also can guide your science if you know what the harm is, right? We have to have our environmental objectives and we have to define harm before we can figure out whether ocean fertilization is gonna do no harm, right? So it, it may be more of a guidance than a, a reality. Well, <clears throat> this is quite a different topic. Um, but uh, in terms of the priorities uh, for deep sea science, um, <clears throat> so I think that um, over the last 10, 20 years, we deep sea scientists uh, were very good at identifying knowledge gaps. Um, and we were also very successful in trans, trans uh, or informing government uh, decisions and uh, passing scientific information into governance. There's lots of good examples, and the BBNJ is just another one. What I think we were not very good is in finding solutions to solve the data gap problem, the data, uh, the, the knowledge gaps problems. And I still think today uh, that what we are really missing is a long, <laughs> convince the society and the governments that we need a long-term strategy uh, to be able to to finally get that uh, scientific information to inform uh, the society and, and better uh, management. This could come, of course, with long-term um, <clears throat> financial support that would help implementing the regulations that not only the United Nations, but also the European Union and our own countries adopt in the parliament, uh, which is then very difficult for us to, to go out to the sea, for example, to the deep ocean and do uh, the sampling that is needed to support those regulations. So I think really this is the bottleneck. And uh, we usually say that space scientists are very good in... Um, in passing their message of the need to go to Mars, for example. We haven't been that successful in transforming, in, in passing the information on the, the need to go to the deep ocean and, and, and do proper science to inform management. In Europe, there's the European Space Agency, and we have been advocating for a long time for having the European Deep Sea Agency. Uh, but most countries, when we knock at their doors, say it's not a priority and we don't have money. So I think this is the bottleneck, and we should probably think, how can we better communicate the need for long-term strategies? Sorry if this was off, a bit off. Of I hope this is getting recorded also. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. So I just wanted to uh, comment on this. On the, the comparison, I think, is not well. It's not exactly the same because no one is threatened if we want to go to space. Everyone would like to go to space. No one has to lose any money from going to space. Whereas it's not the case about the deep sea, and I think that is the problem. And my question would be: What is the responsibility when we? How, I mean, we should improve our communication on of our research and be careful of the message that passes uh, if, if we appear, keep on appearing that we're not sure about our message, then the uncertainty will be the, the message rather than what we actually want. Maybe. Just a few. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, I can, I can. Yeah, oh, oh, so, sorry, it's just to come back in terms, uh, the example we use usually is in terms of the money that society is willing to put for space science compared to the money that the society is willing to put for this. Uh, if I'm allowed, I'll loop back a little bit to the CDR uh, and just state the obvious that, you know, all of these strategies are about growing our long-term carbon stores, which are in the deep ocean, as you mentioned, the dissolved inorganic and you know, particulate and dissolved. And we have extremely poor understanding of the dynamics of these processes near and at the seafloor. And so that is a huge uh, blind spot at the moment because we don't know the variability, we don't know the trends, we have very poor data. And so if we don't know the natural processes, how can we measure impacts as well? Uh, and this remains a huge challenge for us, which is directly related to how do we verify so, you know, the efficiency and the impact, so. So, 
So my question to you is, do you think like deep sea bed mining, um, carbon removal is going to be a, a new source of job opportunities for deep sea biologists? Maybe. <laughs> Well, this sort of follows up on her statement of we have a pretty good idea of terrestrial and near coastal um, carbon sequestration through protection of the Amazon and other forests, but we don't really have a good idea of what the natural ability of the deep ocean is to, to um, absorb and sink these carbon emissions. So I think that's a big gap and would go towards something similar to what they're doing with um, at least calculating what deforestation can do, but in a deep ocean sense context. Yeah. That's a great analogy. Thank you. Uh, right, and I haven't, I mean, this kind of follows on what they're saying, and I haven't sat in on every single one of these talks, so maybe I missed something, but having just spoken to somebody out in the poster room about their poster and atmospheric injection experiments, it occurs to me that something that's missing from a lot of what we're talking about, we talk about science and we talk about policy, but we're missing the venture capitalists. There are people out there who see the problems, the challenges in front of us as a way to make money. And it could very well be that if we're not careful, um, things that they see as solutions, whether or not we see them as solutions, are just going to get taken away from us. And we're there'll be another version of climate change, and it won't be the one that we, that we want. And so I think it's a little blind to think that we just have policy and we just have science. There's money involved. Yes. Thank you. Very important. Uh, and they aren't really at this meeting. No. Right. No. Yeah. Anybody else from back here while I'm here? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I absolutely agree with Allison um, from conversations I've had with people who are in the MCDR world. Um, I feel like a dis I feel like there's almost a not a complete disregard, but they don't take the impacts on biology or uh, other aspects of the ocean into full account. Um, and so I really feel like we need to reach out to that community more um, so that there's a direct uh, conversation. And then the second is less of a uh, gap, more of an opportunity. Uh, we don't, there's so many uh, observational gaps and modeling gaps with the deep ocean. Uh, and now with higher resolution models and Argo floats that can go below 2,000 meters, um, I feel like there's opportunities to improve understanding about how the deep ocean uh, may be changing the future. Uh, and so maybe pushing on the Argo community to have biogeochemical sensors on the Ninja Argo floats, for instance, that would be a, a huge uh, advance, I think, for understanding for uh, ecosystem impacts. And then with the physical uh, modeling I think there's a huge physical oceanography community. You know, I just talked to Allison earlier about how internal wave propagation across ridge and so on causes mixing and, uh, and what that means for ecosystems. Uh, so I feel like that's another potential opportunity for us to understand how the deep ocean might be changing is to leverage some of these high resolution models at global scales. Um, as opposed to some of the CMIP simulation or the line that Natalia showed where there's just a blank assessment, uh, we could probably fill that out with more certainty. We have one minute left. Oh my gosh. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm going to echo what you said. Like, I wish we had an Argo program for the seafloor. I mean, basically, Argo doesn't go to the bottom all the way, and it doesn't work on the bottom. So, you know, we have um, new innovations, but we don't have the equivalent observing system like that. Yeah, something about this? Yeah. There are floats that go to the bottom. It's just that, I don't know if I should yeah. say that. Yeah. It's just that probably the Argo community is like squashing any other sensors also, you know. The, the one that the seismic community is using, acoustic, that they could add other sensors to their floats. It, and they, they are designed to go to the bottom to measure, you know, seismic activity. 
<laughs> Good idea. Okay, I think we have to, to wrap up. You, you want to wrap up? <laughs> no, you go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let, why don't we give all our speakers a hand and everybody else who contributed. <laughs> Thanks, everybody, for joining us today.